All right, my name is Michelle Morand and I'm here with Alexander Rowland. Uh, together 11 years ago, uh, we founded an organization called Cancer Treatment Options and Management. Uh, Alex has a decades long background in the field of cancer lead, leading edge medical science research. Uh, and my background is in counseling, actually, 30 years of experience helping people <clears throat> with addictions um, and eating disorders and all sorts of mental health concerns. Uh, but mostly what I've done is create programs, help people to understand complex information and, and put it into action. Um, and uh, uh, Really, when it comes to precision oncology or leading edge cancer care or cancer at all, um, there's so much information out there and we're going to get into the vast numbers uh, in a while. Uh, but being able to, to know what is most important for you to pay attention to and how to action on uh, the options that exist right now um, is really one of the most critical elements to make sure you're getting the right treatment. So that's really what we're going to be talking about today is um, just how to know what it is you need to know and how to make sure you're getting the right treatment. Uh, so what's going to happen now is uh, I'll ask Alex to say a few words and then we'll pull up a, a little PowerPoint for Alex to walk us through. Um, Alex, would you like to say anything? Yeah, well, first off, I would like to thank you, Michelle, for um, putting, to get, putting this whole meeting together, this whole seminar together and all the wonderful work you've done in translating my uh, scientific uh, uh, jargon <laughs> into, you. Yes, into a, uh, a understandable uh, process. I think you've done an amazing job here and I, I very much look forward to seeing uh, your PowerPoint. <laughs> That's a good, good little indicator. Alex has no clue what's coming, <laughs> but I've taken it easy on him. Uh, so yeah. Uh, and um, so just for those of you who just came in, um, Everything we're going through is in a PDF that'll come to you in an email shortly after uh, our chat today. Uh, if you have any questions as we go, you're welcome to raise your hand or post them into the chat and we will answer them once Alex has gone, gone through the main information he wants to cover. And then we'll get into question and answer and he'll do some of the live consults with each of you. Um, so right now I am just going to share my screen. Um, so that you'll still see Alex, but we'll have a lovely little PowerPoint going on here. Oh, hang on a second. Start from the beginning. There we go. Okay, so you should be able to see Alex and Michelle's fabulous PowerPoint. Is that what's happening on your screens? Yes, I can, I can see okay. the PowerPoint. Okay, Turn great. Yourself. Okay, so we've developed, as I said, we've done a handful of these this last little while on a few different types of cancer, and we've developed a fun little system where Alex just dings uh, when it's time for me to switch to the next slide. So I'm gonna ding for you now, Alex, because that's about where we're at. And um, here's what we're gonna cover today. What is lung cancer? How does it form? What is standard treatment for lung cancer right now? what is happening right now in terms of the science of lung cancer and what are, what are some new options? Why do these new options work better than standard care? How do you know which ones you need? And then we'll talk about how to get access to them. So Alex, would you like to begin? Yes, I'd like to start out with, um, there's been some amazing new developments in uh, non-small cell lung cancers and lung cancers over the last few years. And currently, uh, lung cancers are the poster child of precision oncology. Um, there's really been some amazing new developments, and I'm excited to talk about those. Great. So just to get started, what is lung cancer? Um, as Michelle's outlined here, your lungs are two spongy organs, um, and they take in oxygen, and they release carbon dioxide. So lung cancer uh, basically refers to a type of cancer that, uh, that occurs anywhere in the lungs. There's a variety of different subtypes. Uh, we're gonna be focusing specifically on a subtype that is most common today. Uh, it's called non-small cell lung cancer. And you also have small cell lung cancer, but uh, it's more rare. And a, a lot of what we are showing here can apply to small cell lung cancer, although uh, it's somewhat conditional and you have to take each case uh, independently. 
Quem? Are we going to do the what is lung cancer part here, or did we do that already? Lung we did that. Oh, okay. Can I speak? Are you hearing me? Yes. Hi, my name is Eliyahu. I'm from Montreal. Hello, Eliyahu. Okay, I'm Israeli born. My English hi. is not there. Uh, hi, how are you? Good. Um, and now, if you can you see, I uh, make uh, the chemo after the lung cancer, cancer surgery. Mm. They found, uh, my, my doctor sent me for just test without any symptom and they found uh, that I have a mass, uh, five centim mass in the, my, my left, uh, my left uh, lung. Mm. Oh, then, uh, yeah, two months ago, uh, I got the surgery oh. and they removed uh, the loop that was affected and after that, uh, I did that again, uh, PET scan, and I find that everything is in clean. And the doctor oncologic in Montreal, Jewish Montreal General, uh, he decided to give me a juvent. Mm. Eliyahu, yes. Uh, may I interrupt you for a moment? We're we're actually just beginning with uh, our our overview right now, and then we're going to we're going to hear about. People oh, oh okay. I just uh, just uh, talk who I am and what. Yes, what I yeah. uh, thank you okay. for that. I appreciate okay. that. Okay. We okay. will. Okay. We want to hear about what's going on for you, and Alex will be happy. Yeah, to, exactly. To, because yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. Okay. That's. I, I appreciate. That's the the main reason that you're here is to get some questions answered for yourself. To so hear, first, we want to, to kind for, of. Yeah. To hear from Alex. Yeah. Yeah. Well. Okay. The first part, but then, of course, we want to make sure that we hear from you. Um, but if I can ask you to just hold that thought until we've gone through the main sure. presentation. And, okay, sure. thank you. Sure. Glad you're here. Thank you. Oh, sorry, Alex, you go ahead there. Oh, that's good. Um, so as I was saying in the previous slide, there's two main types of lung cancer. There's uh, none small cell. Um, and then there's uh, also... Uh, small cell. Um, we're going to be focusing on non-small cell today because it's the most common. There's two subtypes of non-small cell lung cancer referred to as adenocarcinomas and squamous cell carcinomas. And basically what these are, are two different cell types that uh, are in the lungs and all other parts of the body. Um, so you see these two different cancers and these two different subtypes um, throughout the body. Uh, many different uh, subtypes of adenocarcinomas and squamous cell. Today, we're going to be focusing mostly on non-small non cell lung cancer of the adenocarcinoma subtype, because that's once again the most common. And then um, we will also be covering some uh, issues with squamous cell. Okay. So how is lung cancer diagnosed, uh, typically in standard care? Um, typically, uh, you would have some sort of pain in your chest or some sort of shortness of breath. Um, you know, there's a variety of different symptoms related to that. Um, some, some people would be coughing up blood depending on their stage. Um, so typically what would happen is doctors would take a look at your, um, at, you know, the, your saliva and what you cough up, your sputum uh, cytology, and then uh, you would get either an X-ray or a CT scan or some sort of scan of the, the chest area. Uh, potentially an MRI. And then once there was a suspicious lump there, um, typically you would be given uh, a biopsy. Mm -hmm. Oopsie, hang on. So, sorry, I have to close my chat window. It's covering up everything. <laughs> One second, I'm not sure how to do this. What's happening, Alex? You've muted yourself, I think. There you go. Can you hear me now? Yep. Okay. Okay, so um, precision oncology takes a slightly different look at lung cancers. And um, often you will see um, 
you know, different sorts of precision oncology being used in lung cancer treatment in standard care, but it's not uniformly applied across all of the different facilities and countries. So one of the most important things in precision oncology and diagnosing a lung cancer is referred to as a PET-CT. Um, so a PET-CT is a little different than other imaging. Other imaging techniques require that you measure the size of a suspicious lump and then follow it over a period of time and watch to see if it grows. And if it grows, then it's assumed to be a cancer. Now that's not always the case. And that can really delay uh, your treatment diagnosis, uh, your treatment and your, you know, getting a proper diagnosis. So a PET-CT is an excellent tool because it detects cancer in real time. And the way it does that is they inject you with a radioactive isotope that's attached to a sugar molecule. And then they give you a CT scan. And so the concept here is that any, uh, any active tissue or highly metabolically active tissue, uh, such as a tumor, which is constantly growing and constantly um, copying itself, the cells are constantly reproducing, and uh, it's highly metabolic, is going to drink up more of this sugar radioactive solution than the other tissues, the surrounding tissues. And therefore, anything that um, drinks up more of this radioactive isotope is going to glow when you get a CT scan after you've had this injection. And so it's very effective. Um, you know, CT scans and x-rays, while they can detect a lump, they can't tell you whether it's a tumor or not, whereas a PET CT can tell you if, whether it's a tumor with a single scan. You don't have to wait for months to see if it grows. And so part of that is done through what we call the SUV activity. And that's the serum uptake value. That's how much of the actual um, radioactive isotope sugar that the cancer cell drinks. And so the more it drinks, the more aggressive it is and the higher the SUV value is. So unfortunately, there's not a lot of PET-CT machines in Canada. Uh, it is used uh, commonly in Europe and in Asia, it's fairly commonly used. And of course, the United States has many different uh, facilities. Um, I think uh, in many cases, a PET CT can, can act drastically change uh, the diagnos diagnosis and the treatment. In many cases where a patient has a single, uh, a single lump and is, is staged as a lower, lower stage, when we get them a PET CT, often they have other tumors that were missed by the CT and the MRIs. So CTs and MRIs are for diagnosing cancer, probably about 50 to 60% accurate, whereas a PET CT is in the mid to high 90s for accuracy um, and sensitivity and specificity, which is false positives and false negatives. So it's a great tool to have. And in at least 80 to 90% of the time, when a patient gets a external PET CT or a private PET CT, it changes their diagnosis and the treatments um, are often modified. So very important tool. Um, and once again, we've seen patients who have had, a, you know, had a higher stage of cancer than they were uh, in initially diagnosed, and that was only determined after the PET-CT. We've actually seen a few cases where patients, in fact, one specific case of lung cancer where a patient was on his sixth course of chemotherapy, and when we got them a PET-CT scan, we found out that they never had cancer in the first place. It was just a benign lump they had in their lungs. So PET-CT, very important. Mm -hmm. And uh, Michelle's put this statistic at the bottom that I think is important. Um, Michelle, would you like to explain that statistic to us? Sure. Uh, you know, the Canadian medical system has a lot going for it, but in terms of diagnostics for cancer care, uh, we're 23 out of 28 countries uh, with public health care programs surveyed by a recent study from the World Health Organization for how we diagnose cancer care or the quality of our cancer diagnostics. Um, so I just, we have a natural sense uh, that, uh, that our medical system is looking out for us, taking good care of us, and it is to the best of its ability. Uh, but uh, there are some areas where we're not even close to the top. And when it comes to cancer, of course, you wanna make sure uh, that you're using the best possible resources, especially when it comes to diagnostics. 
And when Alex was talking about, you know, people have finding out through PET CT, they have a higher stage. What he means is often, well, it probably means a lot of things, but um, in terms of the aggressiveness of the tumor, perhaps, but what I often hear about uh, on my side of things is um, uh, with standard care diagnostics, somebody, um, the oncologist or radiologist was just looking in the location of the primary tumor or what they thought was the primary tumor. And so a CT scan or an x-ray is very, maybe very localized. A PET CT is essentially a full body scan. Uh, so it's also really beneficial because it, it kind of overrides the assumption that there are no metastases and allows you to know for sure if there are, uh, which of course then elevates your stage. And another great benefit, uh, if I could call it that with all due respect to what you're dealing with, of knowing whether you have metastases or not, or, or whether you have a higher stage than you were previously diagnosed at, is it does uh, elevate um, your case. It does make you get kind of faster, better care oftentimes. Um, so just knowing for sure where the cancer is and isn't in your body and um, how aggressive your tumors are can really change the way your doctor treats you, as it says here, 80 plus percent of the time. So yeah, the standard care for um, lung cancers is typically uh, surgery. Um, if, if the tumor is small, you can get uh, surgery. Uh, if it's big and metastatic, then typically surgery is not so much of an option. Then there's radiation to shrink the tumor and uh, standard chemotherapy. Um, we also see a few different types of uh, immune therapy being applied to lung cancers now. There's uh, some basic genetic testing. We're gonna go into detail for that. Mm -hmm. um, typically you'll see EGFR testing, sometimes ALK or BRAF, um, but there's a whole host of different new targeted therapies that um, can be identified for, for treatment. We're gonna be going over a few of those, but usually you'll be tested for a variety of genes. Uh, mutations in certain genes will include the ALK, EGFR, uh, ROS1, BRAF, RET, uh, MET, NTRK1, 2, and 3, um, not so often HER2, but uh, we do see that. Uh, PI, some other ones are PIK, 3CA. Um, there's a variety of different ones that different oncologists will look for, but typically most will look for EGFR, ALK, and a gene called KRAS. Hmm. I didn't add that to the list. I'll that's okay. It's not, a, it's not a target of most therapies, but that's okay. Okay. So... Uh, standard treatment of lung cancers. Uh, there are hundreds of known uh, cancer-related mutations. Well, you know, thousands. Um, and uh, yeah, 20,000 possible mutations um, that you should be tested for. I think uh, that number is probably uh, the very low end. Um, there's many different mutations you could, could be tested for. I'm trying to be conservative. <laughs> it's very conservative, yes. Uh, any of which could be critical mutations for driving your cancer. It's important to get tested for as many different uh, genetic alterations as possible, whether they're mutations or other types. Mm -hmm. So if you've been tested um, for a short list of genes above and you weren't told you don't have any disease markers, I think it's really important. I think it's a great point Michelle has put here. Um, you know, get a thorough DNA, tumor DNA sequencing test. Don't rely on a small panel of what we call spot mutations that are just common mutations. Uh, get a proper full tumor DNA sequencing panel. We're going to discuss more about that in a bit. Yeah, I do. I do. I do make this point a few times throughout our chat today because I just really, it, it, just in case it hasn't sunk in, I just really want you to to be taking this away fundamentally. You cannot have cancer without having mutations. So if your doctor has said you don't have any mutations or you don't have any markers what they're really saying is based on the test I can offer you, we didn't find any markers. That doesn't mean there aren't any. And, it, and we're going to talk more about why it's so important for you to know what they are. Yes. So Michelle, did you want to talk about the precision oncology? Tell sure. Us. Yeah, just briefly. So this is just dropping a pin in it. Uh, and then Alex will tell us mo more. But um, really what precision oncology is really it's a fancy name that's given to leading edge cancer care. It just means we are using the most precise and, and accurate diagnostics. Uh, we are identifying 
um, using personalized research rather than kind of general, oh, you have, you have lung cancer, therefore these are the options for you. We're saying, okay, you have a tumor in your lung. Um, let's find out a little bit more about it. What are, what are the key elements of that tumor? and what treatments have been designed to target those key elements. And that is what we're talking about when we talk about a targeted therapy plan. And then how we monitor that treatment with precision oncology. Uh, we have a tool that is 99.9% .9 accurate as opposed to those CT scans we were talking about earlier that's you know 60-ish to 70% accurate and requires many months. Uh, so we're gonna go through each one of these and talk a little bit about why they matter and again, some specifically targeted therapies for different common mutations associated with lung cancer. So you can get some drug names and some information to, to uh, start to follow up on. So as we said before, cancer is a disease of genetic mutation. So uh, if you have cancer, it means that you have some mutations. Um, and as, as genetic testing has evolved, pharmaceutical companies have also been following along with this uh, type of diagnostic and they've been designing treatments called targeted therapies uh, that are designed to target certain parts of the cell or certain elements in your body that are influencing cancer or allowing it to grow. Um, we'll talk more about that later. Um, but really genetic testing and in finding out what is the makeup of uh, your tumors and what's driving your cancer is so critical because there are hundreds of these targeted therapies right now um, and knowing uh, which one is right for you is, is impossible without that testing. So Alex is gonna tell you about this stuff, but there, there's really three, if we're trying to figure out what genetic tests, as if anybody out there actually tried to explore genetic testing on your own, uh, it, yeah, yes, a few of you sure have, because it, it's er, I, the information is out there about how important it is, and yet uh, this statistic here is kind of overwhelming, 7,000 genetic tests in the world right now. Um, if you're not a molecular oncologist or, or, you know, a specialist in that particular field or don't understand a lot about genetics and cancer, how do you even know where to start, what, which test is going to be best and how can you tell? Because of course, every company thinks their test is the best. So what we're gonna to do today is walk you through some of the key things you need to be looking for in a test and why. So you're not, you're not just taking our advice, you're, you're educated about what's most important and you can go and take a look at each of the tests you might come across down the road and make sure they're ticking the most important boxes. Um, so Alex, you go from here. There's the three key pieces. Uh, I've made a slide for each one of these. Um, so let's start here with fusion genes. What the heck is that? Yeah, so if you just want to back up to the previous slide, Michelle, sure. I just wanted to yeah. mention. So uh, typically, cancer is a disease of the DNA, and more specifically, a disease of the genes. And so DNA is sequestered into different components called genes. Um, there's roughly 25,000 of those in our human genome. And uh, they all get used for different purposes. Some never get used, some are turned on only in your embryo. Um, and then others are turned on all throughout your life. Some are only turned on to replace tissue and grow. Um, there's a variety of different things, um, different gene functions together, and they all work together. So in cancer, what happens is these genes get altered, altered and they get mutated and damaged. And uh, there's a couple of different mechanisms. And so the mechanisms are really important because uh, the mechanisms that are causing the damage dictate how that gene is damaged, how it's going to function, and what drugs are going to be required to treat that person's cancer. And more importantly, what form of diagnostic tools are you going to need to use to detect that specific alteration? And so we're going to be covering uh, three different types of molecular alterations that occur to genes. One of them is called fusion genes. Uh, the other is called mutations. And then the third one is going to be called overexpression. So you can go to the next slide now, Michelle. <clears throat> Excuse me. So what's a fusion gene? So a fusion gene... Uh, so genes are 
basically structured uh, with a control region at the beginning of the gene that allows that gene to be turned on and off. And that's referred, it's like a light switch. And then you have the actual gene product, which is broken down into a series of little um, uh, components called exons uh, and introns. So that's not important. Uh, the important take home message is that a gene is composed of a control region, which is basically an on off switch at the beginning of the gene, uh, like a light switch. And then there is the structure of the gene that produces the final product. So when an, basically what happens with a fusion gene is you get a type of gene called an oncogene and anything that's onco refers to cancer. So an oncogene, um, is something, it's actually a normal gene uh, that gets turned into a cancerous gene in, in a particular process. So what happens is you get a, uh, a gene that's supposed to be turned off that causes cells to reproduce. And this gene will, uh, um, it's supposed to be turned off all your life. It's probably turned off on only in brief periods of time. And this gene will get uh, kind of mixed up with a gene that's turned on all the time. And so it's kind of like that old Reese's peanut butter cup commercial where one person is eating uh, out of a jar of peanut butter and another person is eating um, some chocolate and uh, they bang into each other and the chocolate goes into the peanut butter and the person says, hey, you got chocolate in my peanut butter. And the other person says, hey, you got peanut butter on my chocolate. That's kind of what a fusion gene is. And so what happens is you get a gene that's not supposed to be turned on because it causes cells to grow and divide. Um, and that's only something you want to have at certain times in your life. And it gets the control region um, of, a, of a gene that's always turned on. And so what happens is basically these two genes exchange their control regions and you get all of a sudden a gene with a new control region that's turned on all the time when it's supposed to be turned on off. So um, basically to summarize what a fusion gene is, is they switch roles. The oncogene is now turned on all the time and the housekeeping gene is turned off always now. Mm -hmm. Okay, you can go to the next slide. Okay, so mutations, I mean, a fusion gene can be looked at as a mutation, but we like to refer to it as a, uh, a, a huge event. In other words, you're, you're exchanging two components of a gene, whereas a mutation typically happens to one of these base pairs of a gene. So if you look to the slide on the right, you'll see these little cross links. And these are actually two different um, DNA base pairs. So you'll have one DNA base pair in one strand and one DNA base pair on the other strand, and they attach to each other and meet in the middle. And so the pairing is always the same. They're based on the name of the amino acid and there's four of them. So you have uh, an A and a T which pair together and a G and a T, or a G and a C that pair together. Um, and they're referred to uh, by the first name of the amino acid. So a A is an adenine, a T is a thymine, a G is a, cytos or a, G is a guanine and a T is a, a cytosine. And so they, they connect together and they form these cross links between the two outside strands. Now, just a note here, this picture is uh, actually backwards, DNA spirals in the other direction. Um, so um, there's been some- uh, some Alex's pet peeve, totally <laughs> pet peeve. I'll fix that for next time. Yes, it is my pet peeve. However, yeah. I will say that um, the, standard, um, the standard spiral of DNA uh, is not, uh, confirmed in every situation. We know there's many different conformations of DNA. So we'll just refer to this as what we call beta DNA, which has a, the re reverse spiral of standard DNA. So um, what mutations are? Our mutations are changes to one of these little rungs. So it looks like a ladder, we'll call these rungs. Um, and what happens is one of these rungs gets changed. So you have a specific order and the order is these rungs in the ladder. And when you change one of those rungs, it changes the way that gene functions. So when a gene uh, gets mutated, the structure gets altered. And so when it binds to its, its partner amino acid, uh, it changes um, or its partner gene. So typically a gene is gonna bind to another gene or attach to a receptor or have some function. Um, when it does that, 
then it's it's not going to have a different function or it's going to it's going to have a different function now and what's going to happen is that particular uh, gene in most cases with cancer uh, a gene will bind onto a receptor or its partner gene and then it will fall off after its job is done in oncogenes typically what happens is these mutations cause the genes to stay stuck to their partner and so they constantly signal and that uh, signaling pathway is turned on uh, all the time. It's called constitutive signaling uh, instead, of, uh, instead of the gene releasing once it's binding. Mm. So that can definitely change the way the gene functions and it can alter the whole signaling pathway. Mm. So you can go to the next slide. And so uh, the third type of mutation or alteration that can happen is called overexpression. And overexpression is basically the production of the gene, how much of that gene is produced. So it, it's not necessarily a damaged gene with a, a slightly different function. It is too much of the gene being produced. And so if you have too much of the gene being produced, then that signaling pathway is going to be turned on a lot longer than it's supposed to be. And if that signaling pathway happens to be one that tells a cell to grow and copy itself and divide, then that's going to be a problem and that's going to create cancer. So most alterations here will cause an excessive overactivation of a signaling pathway. Um, you also get mutations in tumor suppressor genes, but we can't target those yet with uh, actual targeted therapies. All of the targeted therapies we use uh, with very few exceptions, uh, will target a gene that is overactivated. And it's going to be either overactivated by a fusion, um, by a mutation, or by overexpression. And overexpression is often what we call an epigenetic uh, feature. In other words, it's something that is not altering the gene structure itself, but it causes the control region to be overactivated. Okay, you can go to the next slide. Excuse me, I have to sneeze. Ah, oh, it's stuck in there. <laughs> it will come out that. soon, I'm sure. I hate that. Yeah, so, so in order to determine which one of these alterations you have, there's three different types of molecular testing. Um, you could call it genetic testing, but um, there's a variety of different terms. Uh, genetic testing is a, is a perfectly good term for that, but usually when you talk about genetic testing, uh, most doctors think of that as inherited mutations, which is not what we're discussing here. We're discussing alterations that happen inside the tumor cells entirely and specifically to the tumor cells themselves. Events that cause your normal cells to turn into tumor cells. And so the types of tests we would use to look for overexpression or mutations or fusion proteins um, are tumor DNA uh, testing or tumor DNA sequencing and then RNA expression testing, which looks at the product, uh, that looks at the amount of the gene. So tumor DNA testing can look at mutations. It can also detect some fusions. And RNA expression testing looks at the accumulation of the gene product. And there's also inherited mutation testing uh, where you look for a typically a damaged oncogene. In other words, uh, a gene, or not an oncogene, sorry, a damaged tumor suppressor, my apologies. Um, and this would be uh, something that would create a increased sensitivity to certain carcinogens. So tumor suppressor genes protect your DNA against the uh, cancer causing mutations. And if they see a gene or a cell that's overactivated and copying itself, they will uh, cause that cell to uh, get broken down. And so when you have damaged tumor suppressor genes, then you, can, you don't have that same ability to protect you against DNA damage and these alterations. Mm -hmm. So precision oncology simplified, um, what do we need to look at? We would look at your medical history. We would need to know uh, your specific set of mutations and they're gonna be unique in you. Um, and I just wanna say a little thing about uh, mutations. You know, DNA is probably the most complex molecule we've ever discovered in our universe. Um, we barely touch the surface of it, but we do know a lot about it. Just to show you how many different um, possible mutations you can have in DNA, uh, I think it's important to compare that to uh, another subject, astronomy. Uh, you know, when you look at astronomy, 
you look up at a little dot in the sky and you think, wow, that could be a star. That could also be, uh, you know, trillions of stars all in, you know, a massive uh, new galaxy. Uh, you, the, the, the numbers are staggering and the distances are staggering. Well, in DNA, it's even more staggering. And I'll give you a brief example. So most genes are about, you know, 10,000, 20,000 DNA base pairs. Some genes get as high as 230, 240,000 base pairs. But if you just look at the amount of possible mutations in 150 base pairs, which is a tiny fraction of a gene, very, very small amount, uh, the amount of possible mutations in just 150 base pairs would be calculated by taking the amount of DNA nucleotides we have, which is four, and putting that by a power of 150. That's how many base pairs we'd be looking at. So just to look in that small amount, the number that that gives you is significantly more possible mutations than all of the atoms in the known universe, which is just an infinite number. And that's just one tiny fraction of a gene. So the amount of possible mutations in each person is staggering. We can't even compute that um, because we don't have calculators that can deal with numbers that high. So it's an amazing amount of mutations. Uh, you, so therefore you want to look at as many mutations as you can. And this is one of the problems with why cancer is such a difficult disease to treat is because everyone has their own unique set of mutations. We've never seen two sets of mutations exactly the same in any two cancers. And more importantly, uh, your individual tumor cells can have different mutations within the same tumor. So that's many conflicting um, or compounding issues with uh, dealing with cancer. Mm -hmm. So secondly, or thirdly, we'll look at how these mutations interact with each other. Does one mutation cause another mutation to act differently? Um, and that would tell us whether you need to have targeted therapies together and what combination of targeted therapies you'd have. Uh, importantly, we would look at the treatment or combination of the treatments that are best for your mutations. Um, obviously, we'd want to look at the dosing of those treatments. You know, how much do you need versus how much is the standard? And importantly, we would want to ensure that anything is FDA approved. Um, it would be nice to have it Health Canada approved if you live in health in Canada, but that's not always possible. For us, the bottom line is whether a drug is FDA approved. Um, we don't suggest using anything that's not FDA approved. Um, and also clinical trials. Is there a clinical trial with valid data that can offer you the drug for free that you need? So next slide. So what is targeted therapy? Well, targeted therapy is the evolution of cancer treatment. Since we've discovered DNA and since we've uh, been able to determine that cancer is a, a disease of the DNA um, and that different gene mutations cause cancer, all of the, well, the vast majority of the research and the new drug development has been what we call targeted therapies. In other words, drugs that target a specific molecular feature that is unique to the cancer cell. These drugs uh, can be administered, or you can go back. These drugs can be administered in a variety of different forms, um, intravenous, uh, pill form, um, and they will specifically only affect the cells that have those specific mutations. In other words, the cancer cells. Um, as a rule, targeted therapies have less uh, side effects than standard chemotherapy. Standard chemotherapy is a class of drugs um, uh, that what they do is they will interfere with the reproduction of a cell. Uh, and they do that in a variety of different ways. Typically what they would do is they'll add what's called a methyl group to uh, the DNA so it can't copy itself. And it's like basically putting a cement block in the middle of the road. Uh, the DNA transcription machinery um, and the transposition machinery can't bypass that methyl tag and then the cell will just break down and get recycled. So that's how standard chemotherapy works. Unfortunately, standard chemotherapy is only active in your body uh, for a short period of time. So if you have a pill or an injection um, of a standard chemotherapy drug. It's going to kill everything that happens to be rapidly reproducing. So it's not specific. And many of our normal cells are rapidly reproducing, such as hair cells and nail cells, immune cells, 
cells lining the interior of certain organs. So a lot of those cells uh, will also be affected by chemotherapy, and that's why it has so many side effects. And additionally, um, the chemotherapy, while it is great at reducing the bulk of the tumor, it doesn't actually affect any cells that don't happen to be reproducing. So if you have cancer cells that are not reproducing, such as uh, cancer-causing stem cells, then uh, the chemotherapy is not, not gonna affect it, and it's gonna come back after the chemotherapy. And also stem cells, which produce the, most, the, the bulk of the tumors, um, are not typically targeted by uh, standard chemotherapy. And we can see that uh, when people get chemotherapy and they lose their hair or their nails fall out, um, as soon as they stop the chemotherapy, the hair grows back. And that should be a good indication that the uh, chemotherapy drugs don't affect the actual uh, stem cells that cause the cancers. Okay. I so, just wanted to add this in because I yeah. think there's so, so much stress associated with cancer. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I think wherever there's an opportunity for us to feel hopeful, we should take it. And, I, and when I came across this statistic, I really wanted to share it with you. Uh, right now, in 2021, in the world, there are 100,000 clinical trials for cancer. That's a lot. It is. And if we understand that what that means is in each of those trials, there's either a new drug being trialed, uh, and almost certainly a targeted therapy, and or uh, new combinations being explored. Um, so if you think about what that means and, and how many we can get into uh, how many thousands of papers come out every year in response to this vast number um, of trials and other studies that are going on. Um, and if we think about each one of those th thousands of papers, perhaps providing an option for you or something that's going to be specific to some of the mutations involved in your cancer. Um, and again, every year there are more and more of these studies uh, and more and more targeted therapies and more and more options. So right now we want to, we, we obviously want to make sure you get a, on the right treatment as quickly as possible and um, keep an eye out for all the new developments that are coming over the course of this year and beyond uh, because they almost certainly will provide improvements. Yeah, and on that point, Michelle, I think a perfect example um, of what you're saying here is this mass, uh, mass amount of information. Uh, you know, this really is the problem is these, you know, these, this mass amount of clinical trials are producing so much data. Uh, there's really not a lot of people looking at it. And that's kind of what our goal is, is to really sift through this data. But we do it on an individual level for each patient rather than doing it for a group of people they're going to have completely different genomes we take one person's genome and then we search the data mm -hmm. and uh, i think a perfect example of this is a disease called aml uh, acute myeloid leukemia um, this disease has not had a uh, great advance for many many years um, the same treatments were used you know for for many many years and very dismal outcomes. I think survival is about a year and a half. Uh, most people didn't do very well on those drugs and it was just basic chemotherapy drugs. However, in the last three years alone, it's been over 13, 13 new FDA approved targeted therapies for AML. And each one of these radically changes the outcome of, of the disease. Patients are living way longer now. Uh, you know, uh, six, seven, 10 years, sometimes even cured with these new drugs. However, they are targeting specific molecular features. And if you don't know the molecular features of your AML, you would never know which one of these drugs to use. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, these drugs are being introduced so quickly, most doctors don't understand where to give them. And so they will just say, well, we don't have any genetic testing. Let's just try this new drug on this patient. So it's so important to get genetic testing so you understand where you fit in this massive amount of data. Mm. You can go to the next slide. So uh, what are off-label cancer treatments? An off-label drug in short is a drug that was approved for one type of cancer or one type of condition and has been then used in another uh, without having approval in that type. 
So it's an FDA approved drug and it's been used uh, for let's say breast cancer. And then later on, um, uh, let's say a scientist or a doctor will find, well, you know, that, that drug targets the PIK3CA um, mutations in breast cancer. But I have a, I have a patient here now with, with a colon cancer that has mutations in that. And so what they'll do is they'll apply that same drug that was designed for breast cancer to that colon cancer patient and find out that it actually works great. So we do know that a lot of these drugs, in fact, almost all of them, are able to be used across different cancer types. And so if uh, you're seeing an oncologist that is ex experienced in one type of cancer, they're not going to know what sort of uh, treatments or drugs that are being used in other cancers could potentially be used in yours. So uh, that's an important thing. And it's important that um, oncologists are trained in every type of cancer and don't just specialize. I think specialization is really slowing down the application of uh, different drugs to different cancers. Mm -hmm. in, on that note, in certain countries, remember that thing back at the PET-CT slide that were 23 out of 28 in Canada for mm -hmm. diagnostics. In certain countries, the UK comes to mind, um, they actually have, uh, they have the medical oncologists who are on the front line prescribing and monitoring how the treatment's going, but they also have like science-based oncologists who are, who are tasked with gathering some of this information and, and assisting the medical oncologists in making these decisions. And I'm excited to see that. I think that is the, the way of the future um, and it will help take care of some of these problems we're talking about today. Right. Okay. So uh, now we're gonna get into actual uh, precision oncology and actual applied precision oncology in uh, lung cancers, specifically non-small cell lung cancers. So what we're going to do now is we're going to cover each gene and tell you what sort of variations and alterations happen in that gene and what sort of drugs can be used to treat the, those particular mutations. And this, while it applies to lung cancer, can it be applied to many different types of cancers. So these genetic mutations and these drugs will not just work in lung cancers, they'll probably work in just about any cancer that has that molecular alteration. Now, there are exceptions. Obviously, in certain types of cells, um, you know, you may have to combine it with different drugs, but this is a general theme that we're going to be discussing. So the KRAS mutation, this is tested for in lung cancers. Um, and typically, you'll have a variety of different mutations that will be tested for. Uh, typically, KRAS mutations have been undruggable. We haven't been able to develop a drug to target KRAS mutations for a variety of reasons. I won't get into that because it gets very com complicated very quickly, but there is one specific mutation that we now have uh, called the KRAS G12C, and how that, um, uh, how that works is the gene name is first, so KRAS is the name of the gene, and then the, the, G or the amino acid that is supposed to be at that position, at the but the 12th position is called the G, the guanine. And in this particular case, it's been altered to a C. So the mutation that you're supposed to have is first, then the number of where this mutation occurs in the gene is next. And then the new amino acid that is replacing the original one is the last thing. So uh, a G is being replaced at the 12th position by a C. So there's a new drug, uh, called uh, sotorasib, uh, I think that's how you pronounce it. Um, so this drug is very new, um, but it's actually quite effective in KRAS G12C mutations. And they're using it right now in clinical trials for both lung cancers and for um, other, uh, other cancers like colon cancers and so on. So in KRAS um, or in, in, the, in lung cancers, typically KRAS has been a huge driver it's also a common mutation in many, many cancers, but in, in uh, lung cancers, it's used to determine a type, a type of lung cancer and uh, can rule out certain treatments and so on. And it can be a prognostic indicator. However, however we like to use KRAS mutations um, to track disease. And the reason we can do this is because KRAS mutations are one of the first mutations that occur when a cell, a normal lung cell starts getting converted into a tumor cell. That, that process is called transformation. 
oncogenic transformation. And what happens is a series of mutations happen over time based on exposure to carcinogens. And um, these mutations build up. And then once you have a, a certain threshold of mutations, in humans, you have to have mutations in four separate pathways before a cell can be a cancer. In mice, it's actually three. Uh, they have what's called an active, active telomerase gene. But in humans, you have to have at least four mutations in order to transform a normal cell into a tumor cell. So the KRAS is one of the first mutations that happens. And so because of that, we know that this KRAS mutation is going to be in the vast majority of the tumor cells. And therefore, if we used a blood-based liquid biopsy, we can measure the amount of this KRAS mutation that a person has and say, you know, yes, you have a lot of tumors in your body or, or cancer cells in your body, or yes, your body is responding to treatment or not. So we'll talk more about that later, but I just wanted to mention that KRAS is a valuable mutation because we can use it to track, um, uh, you know, track uh, how a patient is responding to treatments. Mm -hmm. You can go to the next slide. So ALK. So typically ALKs occur in something called fusions, as you mentioned. The ALK gene um, is a gene that is turned off. And so it's important to note here that ALK, ALK uh, is a gene that is only active in the embryonic state. In other words, this gene is, is used to develop the early humans in the embryonic state. And then once they grow up and become adults, this gene is turned off, never to be turned on again. And if it is turned on, it's only turned on very, very briefly for short periods of time to fix certain types of damages. So the important take home message from this is that if you have a drug that targets the ALK mutation and you have an ALK overexpression or mutation, then that's not supposed to happen. So if you see overexpression of this ALK gene in a human adult, it can only be from cancer. And therefore, if you target it, it's going to be one of the driving factors of a cancer cell. And more importantly, um, it's not going to affect anything else in your body. So because of that, ALK uh, drugs that target ALK mutations don't have very many side effects because there's nothing else for them to target. They only target the, the cancer cells. So it's an important consideration. So there's numerous drugs right now that target ALK, uh, crizotinib, serotinib, electinib, brigatinib, loratinib, uh, ensartinib, entrectinib. These are all FDA approved for different types of cancers, but they can be very effective in ALK positive uh, lung cancers. However, right now, doctors typically only look for ALK fusions. But the important thing is a fusion results in overexpression of, of ALK. A mutation in ALK results in overexpression. So the important thing is you don't have to necessarily have a fusion gene or a mutation. The important take home message is if you use a diagnostic test that looks at overexpression, it doesn't matter what causes it. You know you have overexpression of ALK, and therefore one of these drugs will be very beneficial for you. You can go to the next slide. So, EGFR, this is one of the first mutations ever detected in lung cancers. Uh, there's been a ton of different treatments um, and drugs. Um, it's called the uh, epidermal growth factor receptor. And it's, it's um, mutated in certain types of uh, lung cancers, typically those, uh, it's very common in Asian populations. Um, we believe there's some association between cooking over an open wok and all of the um, gases and smoke that's produced by, by um, cooking oil, heating oils and vegetable products and so on um, to a high temperature. Uh, it has something to do with that. Um, we're not entirely sure, but we believe that's what it is. It's not often seen in uh, cancers that are, lung cancers are caused by smoking. So um, the first generation of the drugs, uh, gefitinib and lotinib, were developed many, many years ago. They were some of the first targeted therapies ever designed. And what they do is they bind onto a piece of the gene called the tyrosine kinase domain. And basically that's its activation domain. It's a part of the gene that turns it on and off. And so uh, there's a process called ATP that binds to this TK domain, tyrosine kinase domain, and that turns it on and off. That's the mechanism. You don't really need to know that. But what's important about that is that these drugs reversibly bind to it. 
And so the consequence of that is over time, um, they tend to stop working. And because of that, a bunch of companies develop new drugs uh, called second generation uh, EGFR inhibitors. And these irreversibly bind. So in other words, they don't, they don't fall off the gene after they've turned it off, they stay stuck to it. Um, and so they control it much better. And those two drugs are called afatinib and dacometinib. Um, recently, there's been a new third generation drug that's really changing lung cancer. It's called osimertinib. Um, and this actually uh, binds to, it was designed specifically for what we call a emerging mutation. So often in patients with lung cancer, who, um, you know, they'll go five, six years on the first and second generation drugs, and then they'll stop responding. It's often due to this new mutation in the EGFR called the T790M. And if you recall the T at the 790th position, which is the, the name of the amino acid, uh, gets converted into an M, which is a different amino acid. I won't tell you the names of those because that's not important. Um, the first one is T and the, uh, the second one is it, the, the one that gets converted to is M. And so when that happens, it causes the uh, structure of the EGFR protein to change. And therefore, first generation drugs such as gefitinib and, and second generation drugs can't actually find that binding pocket in the TK domain because there's a bunch of other uh, strands of, of the DNA in its way. And so therefore, um, those drugs don't work, but osimertinib does. And so it was designed for that. Now, more importantly, um, it doesn't affect the uh, normal EGFR expression, which is important. And so therefore, it can have less side effects and be more effective. Um, also, there's a really new drug. So we have this other change called exon 20 insertions. Exon 20 is just a component um, of the EGFR gene. It's a part of it. And you would get these uh, pieces of DNA that got inserted into it. It's a type of mutation called an insertion mutation. Uh, and so there's a new drug now, uh, mobocertinib, that is designed specifically for those type of mutations. So once again, the mechanism defines what drugs are going to work. And importantly, you need to have a test that looks for that mechanism. Okay, so you can go to the next slide. So resistance mutations, we talked about that a bit. Um, so in, in EGFR positive breast cancers, um, so we, we went over this, the T790 mutation causes resistance. So we're gonna, the next slide we're gonna present you with is a list of, of what we now know are resistance mechanisms in EGFR targeted therapy. Okay, you can go to the next slide. So these are some of, just some of the resistance mutations. These are the most common ones um, and the important take home message here is, is once you stop responding to EGFR inhibitors, does not mean you need to go on to chemotherapy. What it means is that you need to find out what your resistance mutation is, and then you need to target that with a drug that targets that specific mechanism. So one of the common ones is EGFR T790M. And so if you've been on gefitinib or any of the first or second generation EGFR inhibitors, now you would go on to osimertinib and that would work very well if you have a T790M mutation. Um, if you have something else called a HER2 alteration where you can get mutations in your HER2 gene. HER2 is a gene that's commonly looked at. It's a receptor, so it pokes outside of the cell. And so there's a variety of drugs called monoclonal antibodies called Herceptin and pertuzumumab um, that can target that. So there's a ton of different treatments. Uh, HER2, HER2 overexpression, is uh, a common feature of a type of breast cancer called HER2 positive breast cancer. So all of the drugs that are used in HER2 positive breast cancers can be used for HER2 alterations. Now you have to determine whether you have a mutation and you require a drug um, that targets the mutations of HER2 or if you have overexpression and you require a drug such as a monoclonal antibody that targets overexpression of the HER2. There's also another gene called BRAF uh, mutations are common in that. So there's BRAF inhibitors. BRAF was first found in melanomas and uh, a bunch of drugs were designed to target BRAF mutations in melanomas. So now they can be used in lung cancers. There's also PIK3CA mutations. Um, these are common in estrogen positive breast cancers. Um, they tend to emerge later on after about five or six years of treatment on um, endocrine therapies. 
and you know, anti-estrogen therapies and estrogen positive breast cancers is a few different drugs um, that can target this now. One of the one that's recently been, been approved and is available in Canada now is called Alpelisib. Um, and that can be used to target mutations in any cancer that has PIK3CA mutations. Um, there's also uh, something called MET, and out of the gene, and it commonly gets amplified. And then there's another process that can happen called small cell lung cancer transformation. And this is where a non-small cell lung cancer transforms into a small cell lung cancer. And therefore, it has a completely different phenotype. Now, once again, um, there's probably a lot of genetic changes that occur that result in this. Uh, we don't have all of those yet because it's kind of a, a process we haven't really looked into a lot. Um, we do know some of the genetic mutations um, and um, you know, we are looking into that, but it's a little more difficult to target than one that has an obvious common gene alteration. So once again, you need to get retested and find out what changes are happening in your cancer if you've stopped responding to EGFR inhibitors. Mm -hmm. Okay, next. So ROS1, it's another gene that's, that's commonly mutated um, in non-small cell lung cancers, you know, and other cancers. And so there's a variety of different targeted drugs. Uh, drugs that are available right now are prisotinib, entrectinib, and seretinib. And so uh, with ROS1, you can get fusions where the control region of a gene that's turned on all the time gets attached to ROS1 and turns ROS1 on all the time. Or you can have mutations that cause ROS1 to get stuck to its partner and, and results in constitutive signaling. Or you can just have overexpression where uh, the control region that turns on ROS1 uh, gets overactivated and it gets turned on uh, permanently. So you can go to the next slide. So then there's BRAF, and as I mentioned, BRAF was first found in uh, melanomas, and now we see it in all kinds of different cancers. It's also found in um, BRAF mutations are found in colon cancers, and there's a protocol called the Beacon Protocol that works really well for patients with colon cancers that targets the BRAF and some other genes. Um, so once again, if you have a BRAF mutation, um, you can look at overexpression of BRAF, that's not so common. We mostly see mutations in BRAF rather than overexpression of it. Um, I haven't really seen any BRAF fusions, but that doesn't mean they're not out there. We just haven't really noticed them yet. So two of the drugs that are FDA approved are vemurafenib and dubrafenib. Um, in lung cancers, uh, the best results are found to uh, occur when you combine BRAF inhibitors with MEK inhibitors. And that is because um, when uh, with lung cancers, they're a little, they occur in cells that are a little different than melanomas. Uh, melanomas occur in cells called melanocytes. And um, the signaling pathway for BRAF is uh, a little different in those cells um, than it is in other cells. So in um, melanomas, you just need the BRAF inhibitor by itself. But when you look at lung cancers, they have a functionally redundant pathway. In other words, you know, they're kind of like a, uh, a jumbo jet where they have multiple systems in case one breaks down. Well, um, these cancers, lung cancers, also have multiple redundant uh, backup pathways. So if you inhibit BRAF by itself, it causes overactivation of the MEK pathway. And so therefore, you want to use a BRAF inhibitor with a MEK inhibitor. And uh, one of them is called trametinib. So you can go to the next slide. Then there's RET. RET's commonly, uh, RET alterations are commonly uh, fusions, but we've also seen mutations, um, not so commonly, but we often see overexpression. So there's some uh, drugs that can be used. Um, now there's drugs that are actually off label. In other words, they were designed to target other mutations, but then consequently found to inhibit REF. Uh, RET, um, cabozantinib, bandatinib, sunatinib, lenvatinib, uh, nintendanib, <laughs> I can't say these properly, I get confused. Um, so these drugs were designed for other types of cancers, but they were found to also inhibit RET alterations and RET overexpression. And so now uh, if you have a, a excess of RET, you can use these drugs. Okay, next slide. And then we have MET, 
And so typically you see things called fusions. Um, you can also see mutations, a type of mutation called exon 14 skipping um, and overexpression. What happens in exon 14 skipping? Uh, genes are broken down into coding regions called exons and they're numbered you know, one to uh, whatever number of exons that gene has. It could be 25, it could be 30, it could be four, it could be seven. Um, but what happens in the MET gene is uh, you get a mutation that causes the exon 14 to be cut out. So it's like, you know, basically cutting it out and missing it. Now the exon 14 um, codon or, or exon 14 in MET um, just coincidentally happens to encode for the duration that gene is active. So it's kind of like, you know, when the gene gets turned on, uh, then in exon 14, the, the coding that tells that the, the transcription machinery, okay, this gene is going to be active for, you know, 50 seconds. Um, so when you take out exon 14, you take out that control. And so now the gene is turned on and it's active permanently. So that exon 14 contains the coding sequence that tells that gene that it's only supposed to be active for a short period of time. And now it's removed and now it's turned on all the time and MET causes cells to grow and metastasize. Mm -hmm. So uh, there are two different uh, brand new drugs that are targeted um, met exon 14, and they're called cabmatinib and tepotinib. Uh, they're both FDA approved now. Um, but there's also some off-label drugs that coincidentally, they're designed for other, other cancers, but they also um, will target met exon 14 skipping mutations. And so um, those are crizotinib and ca ca cabozantinib. Um, and then, um, so crizotinib, if you recall, uh, we covered that previously in a different slide. Uh, and so um, it's also effective in MET uh, exon 14. And more importantly, um, uh, cabozantinib uh, was found. So when, so typically before they had these uh, uh, MET targeted drugs, which are relatively new and just out now, um, when they had exon 14 skipping in uh, non spall cell lung cancer, uh, they used crizotinib, but it only worked for a short period of time. And, and then what we found out is that after crizotinib stops working in these patients, then you can go to cabozantinib and it actually produces responses once patients become resistant to crizotinib. So if you've got an exon 14 skipping met mutation and you've had crizotinib and you've stopped responding, then you can go on cabozantinib and now you could probably also go on cabmatinib or tepotinib. Okay. So another gene, uh, NTRK1, um, uh, 2, and 3. So there's drugs now. Um, I see X114 skipping. Uh, that's a no. mistake, Michelle. Oh, sorry. Okay, I'll fix that. Yeah. So cancel that X114 X skipping. That's not in NTRK1. As far as we know, I mean, it may happen. Maybe you're predicting the future here, Michelle. <laughs> it could definitely be accidental. Yes, yeah, so we see fusions, we see uh, occasional mutations, but we often see overexpression. And so if you have overexpression of NTRK1, 2, or 3, or fusion genes, um, there are two targeted therapies. Uh, one's called larotrectinib, and the other is called entrectinib. So you can go into the next slide. So HER2, as we mentioned in breast cancer, um, so there's a bunch of different things that can happen in HER2. You can have mutations. So her, her two mutations are targeted by drugs called neratinib, um, osimertinib apparently, um, dacomatinib and tucatinib. Um, there's also another drug uh, called uh, poziotinib. It's a new drug. It tar targets something called exon 20 mutations in her two. Um, and so this is a slightly different drug. So previously, um, afatinib and dacomitinib were used for exon 20 uh, mutations. Um, they're second generation EGFR inhibitors, ironically, but they also work for HER2 exon 20 mutations, um, but they don't work so well. You know, they'll work in some patients, but not all of them. So now this new drug, poziotinib, um, it's a smaller drug, it's a small molecule, uh, and it has greater flexibility. So it's allowed to get into that binding pocket that's induced by HER2 exon EGFR exon 20 insertions, um, and it can get in there 
and it can um, uh, turn off the drug better than those other ones. Mm -hmm. So once again, I like this comment here, uh, it's small and flexible, so it can get to the cells and work better. That's a good point, definitely. And it probably also crosses the blood brain barrier for that matter. So I think that's a great point, Michelle. Mm -hmm. uh, therefore it can affect brain tumors. And not all HER2 targeted drugs can cross the blood brain barrier. For, for example, ones that target overexpression such as um, uh, Herceptin and so on, they're large molecules, monoclonal antibodies, and they can't, they pro most likely can't cross the blood brain barrier. So they can't affect uh, brain metastasis. Mm -hmm. Um, so once again, HER2 overexpression, the standard drugs are Herceptin, Pertuzumumab, a new drug called TDM1, uh, another drug that I really like called TDXXD, which um, is what we call a drug conjugate. TDM1 and TDXD are drug conjugates. So that, in other words, they, um, they carry the uh, Herceptin and then they are a piece of chemotherapy attached to Herceptin. So they don't, they, they'll bind onto the outside receptor and then they'll release their chemotherapy payload into the uh, cell. Um, so cells can lose their HER2 expression. The receptor can break off over time and that's a bit of a problem uh, because then these drugs won't work. They need the outside receptor to bind onto. Um, and so the beauty of this new TDXD is not only does it release its uh, chemotherapy payload into the cell with the receptor, the HER2 cell, um, but it also kills the cells next to it, which may have lost their receptor. So it's probably more, it's, it's really effective when patients have low HER2 expression. Um, and that's why I like that drug because it's much more effective than the others when you have low overexpression of HER2. Mm. So you can go to the next slide. So immune therapy. Um, this is the new poster child for, uh, you know, for um, many cancers. I think there's at least 25 different FDA approved cancers that have immune therapy. A little primer on immune therapy. There's about 11 or 12 different ways that the uh, cancer cells can uh, hijack the immune system. Um, one of the things with the immune system is, is that uh, it uses a lot of the same resources as cancer cells. So it, it works on the same mechanisms. It likes sugars like cancer cells do. And um, because of that, cancer cells like to hijack the immune system. In other words, once the immune system goes to investigate a tumor, then um, what will happen is the cancer cells can use, you know, one of 11 or 12 different pathways to shut off the immune system and then use all of its resources. So uh, one of those, there's a couple of, we have drugs for a couple of them now. We, um, we have drugs for what's called the PD-1 cascade. And this has been a huge game changer in cancer. Uh, we also have some that will target the CTLA-4 pathway. And then we also have a drug called, um, the targets a pathway called EDO. Although it's not that effective yet, we haven't quite figured out how to use it. But PD-1 inhibitors, uh, we were the first to ever use PD-1 inhibitors in Canada. That patient uh, is still alive six years later. Um, she was on death's door. She had literally months to live and tumors all throughout her body and it eradicated them. We've had quite a few cases now of patients that have had phenomenal responses to immune therapy. Um, we look for certain things in tumor DNA sequencing. One of them is called high tumor mutation burden. We also look for something called PD-1 expression. And then we look for other molecular, can, can you go back for a second? Okay, sure. Uh, we go through other, um, other um, molecular features that, uh, that we look at that can um, determine whether immune therapy is gonna work for a patient or not. But even then, there are some things that we don't know. And so, you know, you just never know when immune therapy is gonna work for somebody. So uh, if you can go into the next slide. In lung cancer, one of the things that we do know is how, how much of this PD-1 expression there is. So PD-1 um, is, uh, you have what's called the ligand that is on the cancer cells and it clicks into the receptor on the immune cells, which are called T, uh, CD8 positive T cells. Um, and these T cells, if you don't have this PD-1 ligand, it's a protein on the outside of the cell. If you don't have that, then the T cell will attack you. 
And so what cancer cells do is they mass produce this PD-1 ligand. So when the immune system comes along to kill them because they're growing too fast and causing havoc, they uh, provide this overabundance of these uh, PD-1 ligands and therefore the um, T cell is um, you know, turned off. And so in uh, certain cancers, you'll see a bunch of T cells inside of the tumor, but they're turned off. So these PD-1 inhibitor drugs, uh, the, the common one is called pembrolizumab or Keytruda. There's also nivolumab, and there's actually a bunch of them now. There's quite a few different ones. Um, these PD-1 targeted drugs, what they do is they reactivate the T cells, the CD8 positive T cells within the tumor, and then these cells actually kill the tumors from inside out. And then they also make up some antibodies against the tumor. So it's like getting a vaccine almost. You get this long-term memory. And so we've only had these drugs around for about five or six years, but what we have seen is when they work, they tend to work in a curative long-term remission manner. So, you know, we've just seen phenomenal results. So lots of factors to determine whether these drugs will benefit you or not. Uh, the standard care right now is to combine them with uh, chemotherapy and radiation therapy. Uh, and they seem to work quite well in lung cancers across the board, regardless of the molecular features. So if you go to the next slide. So um, some of the things we like to look at is we like to know, it says precision oncology for colon cancer, Michelle. Oh, I'm sorry. Yep. Thanks. thanks. <laughs> so that's lung cancer. So um, immunotherapy. So one of the things uh, doctors will look at is they'll look at your PD-1 status. Um, we would also look at that. So if you have low PD-1 expression, um, then um, they don't always offer immune therapy drug by itself. But what we do know is that even if you have low PD-1 expression in your tumors, um, if you combine the PD-1 inhibitor with a um, CTLA-4 inhibitor, such as ipilimumab, or with chemotherapy and radiation therapy, it works much better. Um, if you have high PD-1, and you can even get benefits just from a single agent uh, immune therapy drug. So next page. So for example, um, how we like to look at things, um, this is colon cancer again. <laughs> yes, I just do, this isn't the, obviously I use the same header, but the information is specific to lung cancer. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so um, if you have high PD-1 expression, you can use uh, pembrolizumab or nivolumab. Nivolumab was the first generation PD-1 inhibitor. Pembrolizumab is kind of the second generation. Um, and they work by binding onto the receptor of your T cells. And so therefore, it doesn't matter if the cell has uh, PD-1 expression or ligand, um, it's gonna attack it if it's a chemo. And so typically um, you can get these with low dose chemo and radiation. Uh, another option is a uh, kind of the, these are kind of the new generation of drugs. I call them the third generation, but they could be considered second generation. Um, Atezolizumab is one of those drugs. Um, this drug binds to the actual ligand on the tumor. So pembrolizumab and nivolumab bind the receptor, the PD-1 receptor on the T cells. Uh, Atezolizumab and all of the new, uh, C most of the new um, next generation PD-1 inhibitors actually bind the ligand on the tumor and they stop the interaction between the PD-1 and, and something called B7. Um, so there's a, another drug, a semilipilab, uh, which is a new one, um, can be also used alone. Uh, pembrolizumab or tezolizumab can be combined with low-dose chemotherapy, uh, nivolumab and ipilimumab together. Um, I wouldn't typically suggest it with chemotherapy, um, but uh, I know there are cases where you can have chemotherapy first and then have nivolumab and ipilimumab. Um, so if you wanna to go to the next slide. So just the themes that we like to look at because there's so many different combinations um, is, uh, so because pembrolizumab and nivolumab target both receptors on T cells, um, target, sorry, it's not both receptors, it's receptors on T cells, there's a typo there. Uh, Atezolizumab targets the ligand on, on tumor cells. Um, just a summary. Uh, so the different mechanisms. So uh, PD-1 plus the CTLA-4 inhibitor for low PD-1 expression. Um, 
If you have low PD-1 expression, you can also use a PD-1 ligand inhibitor such as a tezolizumab plus chemo. Um, and or if you have high PD-1, you can use a single agent PD-1 uh, receptor, uh, such as a uh, receptor inhibitor, such as um, nivolumab or pembrolizumab. Okay, but okay. always what we know, and I think this last point is the important one, is that regardless of PD-1 expression, um, it's best to include multiple drugs. So even if you have high PD-1 expression, uh, it basically means that if you have, if you can't tolerate chemotherapy, but you have high PD-1 expression, you can probably get away with using a single agent receptor inhibitor, uh, but it's always preferred to use multiple drugs if you can, including chemo and radiation, okay? Okay, so um, one of the monitoring tools that's really changed how we treat cancer is called the liquid biopsy. Um, and this detects basically the level of a certain driving mutation in your cancer uh, from the blood. So what we do is we take a sample of your blood and we'd look at the level of that mutation. So just a little primer, tumor cells release their DNA and RNA proteins into the blood um, and into various uh, fluids in the body. And they do that as a way of metastasizing. They release them in these little packets called exosomes. And um, actually, in fact, it's even been shown that normal cells could take up these tumor derived exosomes and start expressing these mutated genes or altering these mutated, you know, using these altered uh, and genes and proteins and so on. And it can actually convert normal cells into tumor cells. So the way we do this is since we know if we see your mutations that are being released by exons in the blood, um, and what we do is we look at the amount of that specific mutation that we know is only in your tumor cells. So let's say you are about to start treatment on some drug, you wanna know if it's gonna work, um, then what you do, what we do is we take a sample of your blood and let's say it's 8% before you start treatment, then we take another sample a couple of weeks later. And if it's down to 2%, then we know it's working. If it's gone up or if it stays at 8%, then we know that drug's not working anymore and we need to try a different drug. The importance of this is we can use this to determine whether a treatment is working uh, within you know, eight to 10 days after you start treatment. You don't have to wait four months and measure the tumors and see if they've grown or not. Mm -hmm. uh, importantly, um, this can be used to determine whether uh, immune therapy is working or not. Um, so go to the next slide. Oh, yeah. So uh, in this case, um, anyone who's been on immune therapy has probably heard of pseudoprogression. What pseudoprogression is, is when um, a, a person gets immunotherapy, uh, what happens is these immune cells start copying themselves and rapidly reproducing inside of the tumor. And in some patients, uh, that can cause the tumors to look a lot bigger. And so um, the immune cells are inside of the tumor, they're killing the tumor, um, and they're uh, destroying it from the inside out, but they're causing it to look a lot bigger. And so when you do a CT scan or an X-ray or something, it actually looks like the tumor's bigger and you're not responding to the drugs. And so this happens in about 30% of patients on immune therapy, and it's called pseudoprogression. Um, and so the problem with pseudoprogression, and it's still a problem to this day, is uh, in, when, when, when they first came out with immune therapy drugs, uh, doctors would see this, and then it would also see new tumors popping up. And so the problem with imaging is that you can't necessarily see a tumor that's really small. However, when you have that tumor expand due to immune, immune cells entering it, then all of a sudden it becomes visible. And so what was happening in these patients who got pseudoprogression is their tumors would look bigger and all of a sudden a bunch of new tumors would show up that were too small to be seen previously. And so the doctors would say, oh, you're not responding. You got new tumors and your other tumors are bigger. We're taking you off the drug. And then two years later, these patients would come back to the doctors and say, hey, uh, I'm still alive. I, I feel great. You know, what's going on? And the doctors would say, wow, I thought you'd be dead. I thought you were going to enter you know, palliative care. So doctors don't know how to determine whether a patient has pseudoprogression or real progression. And there's no real tool to determine that. 
Um, if you get a PET CT, because the immune cells are using the same uh, sugars and the same um, things that the cancer cells use to grow, then your tumors are gonna look hot. Even though they're actually being attacked by the immune system, they're gonna actually look like they're active on a PET CT scan. Uh, because once again, um, immune cells drink up sugars and PET CT is a sugar-based assay. So um, you, can, you can look like you have a very active tumor, you have high SUV, but really it's a dead tumor and it's your immune cells that are causing the SUV activity. So the beauty of the liquid biopsy is it can actually tell whether you have pseudo progression because you won't have any more cancer cells releasing exosomes. Um, and that's the way to determine whether you have pseudo progression or not, if you, if, you know, if you can't tell. So if you can go to the next slide. So we're gonna go over some case examples. Um, and I did mention that there's some differences between dental carcinomas and um, squamous cell carcinomas. Uh, typically squamous cell carcinomas don't always have these mutations that they look for in non in adenocarcinomas, but that's not always true. Often it's just because we've never looked for them. So uh, we had a patient recently, um, we'll call him George. He had a squamous cell lung cancer. Doctor had pretty well done everything for him um, and didn't really have any other solutions for him. So what we did was we did tumor DNA sequencing for him and we found that he had a, a MET exon 14 skipping mutation. Um, so, um, that's not listed here, but um, it was a MET exon 14 skipping mutation. So uh, we suggested crizotinib. We also suggested cabmatinib or tipotinib. Um, and then we also um, suggested following off with cabozantinib. So you don't need to know what type two and type one inhibitors are, but um, it's important to understand that type two inhibitors will work after type one inhibitors fail. So um, cabmatinib and tabotinib are drugs designed specifically for MET exon 14 skipping. Prisotinib is designed for a different type of mutation. So is cabozantinib, but they're both found to work for MET exon 14. Um, so we provided this information to George's oncologist. So uh, George's oncologist said, well, I can't access cabmatinib or tipotinib because they're not available in Canada. And crizotinib, I'm not allowed to prescribe it because it's not approved for squamous cell. It's only approved for adenal carcinoma. Um, and, um, you know, cabozantinib is approved for a different type of cancer altogether. So, um, you know, we said, well, let's contact the drug company um, and see if they'll provide it for free or if they'll provide it for discount. So um, we contacted the drug company. Then we had, um, uh, we had George's oncologist follow up and uh, he was able to access both cabmatinib and tapotinib for free for George. So George has been on cabmatinib and, uh, or he's been on crizotinib and now he's gonna get uh, cabmatinib for free and tapotinib. So, um, you know, you never know until you ask. Another case example uh, was Marianne, and this is a woman that called us. Um, she had fairly advanced disease. Um, she had actually been on the Keynote 189 protocol. And so she wanted to know if it was the best for her. And um, uh, she had actually been on it before she contacted us. Uh, it's a combination of pembrolizumab, a Pemotrex 7 platinum-based drug. Um, so there's a, there's a bit of a mistake there, Michelle. Um, she was actually on it when she called us and she wanted to know if it was the best thing. Um, so we confirmed that it was the best thing for her. And this is kind of a unique case um, because typically when somebody calls us up and says, am I on the best thing? And we do tumor DNA sequencing, we will often find out that, you know, hey, maybe that's not the best thing. But in this particular case, the doctor did have her on the best thing uh, based on her, on her sequencing and so on. So, um, the doctor had decided that since some of her tumors were growing and she was having some complications that he didn't think that she was responding. She had some other symptoms, although it was during COVID, um, she was coughing uh, and he thought that the drug had stopped working. And so it looked like her tumors were, had increased in size. We suspected pseudoprogression, we wanted to rule it out. So um, we knew that she had this KRAS G12D mutation 
And so we're able to measure the amount of that mutation in her blood. And we found that it was incredibly low. So we provided this information to the oncologist and said, hey, we believe this patient has pseudo progression because normally she, if she does have progression, she would have a very high amount of her KRAS G12D mutation. And we don't see, we see hardly any. So we believe the patient's still responding. And uh, as a consequence, she was. So you can go to the next slide. Okay. And so um, this is another case we had. Um, once again, tumor DNA sequencing. Um, so uh, the patient's uh, name is Gloria, not her real name. So tumor DNA sequencing did not turn up any targetable mutations. Uh, she just had this one mutation, this KRAS G12D, that as I mentioned previous is not targetable. Uh, we use it as an assessment, once again, with the liquid biopsy, so we're able to do that. So um, we didn't really have an option based on her tumor DNA mutation tumor DNA sequencing results. And she had previously gotten tumor DNA sequencing. Uh, she had a good, uh, a good panel, so we didn't need to look at that for her. So um, what we did was we got her something called a messenger RNA seq test, which looks at expression of genes. And this is something that we um, like to use for all of our patients. We've only had the test around for about a year and a half, but it's been a game changer. Uh, it really changes how we treat cancers. Uh, so what we did was we did this test for her. It looks at over it looks at expression of twenty thousand genes in your tumor, and it compares them to the expression of those same genes in normal cells. And we found that um, she had high overexpression of NTRK one and three, as well as CTLA four. So because of that, we were able to say, hey, this patient's going to respond incredibly well to NT NTRK one inhibitors, and as well as ipilimumab which is uh, um, the target, target CTLA4 overexpression. Ipilimumab is one of the three available um, immune therapy drugs. So we're able to test whether she was responding to these drugs by monitoring the level of her KRAS G12D mutation. So uh, next slide. So did you wanna cover this, Michelle? I can read off the slides as well as the next person. Sure. So we have, so uh, that was a lot to take in. Remember all that stuff's written yeah. down with more, more detail, lots more detail in the PDF that's coming your way. Don't expect yourself to even remember one of those drug names because they're all Greek to me. Um, but all that information will be there for you. Uh, and, it, and you'll be sent a, re a replay of this video that you can watch piece by piece or scroll ahead to the part that's of most interest to you. Um, but just to kind of cap encapsulate what we've covered here, cancer is caused by, as Alex is clarifying for me, it's not specific to mutations, but it is a disease of your DNA. Um, there are right now hundreds of cancer treatments uh, that we could refer to as those targeted therapies we've been talking about. There are uh, tumor DNA tests out there right now that can look at over 600 known cancer-related mutations. And Gee. as Alex just said, it, uh, did you want to say something else? Yes, can 600 known cancer-related genes. Oh, thank you. Um, and uh, and the, R, uh, the microRNA tests that you were just mentioning that can look at 20,000 possible do you want to clarify? Overexpressed genes. genes. Overexpressed genes. Thank you. I am making notes as we go. Um, so uh, we also mentioned because we again that seven thousand different genetic tests. Which one? Da, da, da. We want want you to know what you're looking for. Uh, so you, you definitely want to make sure that you're looking at, at fusion genes, mutations, and overexpression, not just one. Um, and, or if you're going to pick just one, I know Alex has said, pick over expression or test that, test that look at that because it, it covers more of the basis for you. Tumor DNA testing looks at fusion genes and, and mutations. Uh, RNA expression really tells you which of those genes that are mutated in your cancer are there 
uh, to the highest quantity over normal. So it, it references what is normal expression, and then it looks at the ratio of yours over normal. So we, if we use a test like this for you, we're looking to see which ones are showing up in, in the highest quantities over what the normal ratio would be. And that's how we know they're involved in your cancer and need to be targeted. And there are so many targeted therapies. We went through quite a long list right now. Your eyes probably glazed over, but that's just scratching the surface. And that was kind of why we did the long <laughs> drawn out list there is first of all, we wanted again to give you hope and let you know that there are so many options, um, but we wanted to touch on some of the most common mutations that might be relevant and you may also already know, um, but that was just, uh, there's like 20 drug names or more that we listed there for you. And that's just in a handful of mutations. So I, I most want you to know um, that there are just so many options out there. And um, it's really critical that you have the proper testing to find out which ones are best for you. Because without this testing that we've been harping on about today, your doctor can't give you these drugs, even if they really want to. And we gave you some case examples just now um, to illustrate what's possible, but, but I also wanted really to illustrate in those case studies how willing oncologists are to use this information when it comes mm -hmm. to them. They may not know how to get these tests or depending on the system in which they work, they may not be able to offer you these tests, but they are receptive to this information. Their goal is to help you live as long and healthy a life as possible. And when you present them with some good evidence about what treatments are gonna work for you, most oncologists are, are very open to helping you access those treatments. Um, and of course, what's the point in figuring out all this stuff if we're not gonna make sure it's working as well as it could? Um, and that's where the liquid biopsies come in, just a simple blood test um, that really can tell you with such high accuracy and very quickly after you start treatment, if that's what you need. The liquid biopsies are also really excellent for monitoring, for early detection of recurrence. So we have quite a few uh, clients who get a, like an annual liquid biopsy. They're now, they're in remission, it's all good. And so maybe once or twice a year, we'll send a nurse to their home, draw some blood, and let them know, yep, everything's still fine. Uh, and that's a great relief for them. And they, they don't have to go for scans in order to assess this. They can just tell with that blood. Um, and I think, uh, I think that's it. So uh, yeah. it, we're going to go to question and answer now, but I do just want to let you know how to reach me. My email is there. Of course, you, you can reach out to consult with Alex anytime if you want to ask specifically about your case, if we don't get to answer all your questions when we do Q&A just now. Um, and everything we've talked about here, we can either advise you on how to go about doing this for yourself, or of course, uh, we've been at this for 11 years now at, uh, around the world. So we can help you regardless of where you live to access all of these things. Um, yeah. Okay. So, Alex, was there anything else you wanted to add before we open the floor for questions here? There definitely is. I I, I want to say that um, first off, when Michelle first approached me about doing a seminar on lung cancers, um, I don't think she had any idea of how much information we now have on lung can cancers, and um, I I wanted to keep it you know, fairly succinct and simple, but I also wanted everyone to understand the amount of possible directions that proper diagnostics can lead you in and the amount of different treatment opportunities a proper diagnostics can offer you. So um, I unfortunately dumped a massive amount of information on Michelle um, at the last minute and she was stuck trying to make heads or tails of it and translate it into a format that uh, a non-scientist could understand because that's her expertise. So I do apologize to Michelle for dumping all this extra material on her at the last minute. And, um, you know, hence the colon's she, cancer think, slide at the yes, top. I think, I think she's just done an amazing job of sorting oh, this thanks, out. And Alex. I really want to thank you for that, Michelle. Thank you. You're welcome. I'll fix those slides as you mentioned before this gets sent out to anybody. So it's, right. so it's all correct information for you. Okay. So now I'm going to stop sharing this lovely presentation. Uh, and uh, let's see here. I'm assuming you have some questions. Uh, specific, yes. Okay, let's let's first come, first serve here. Uh, so, 
yeah, I'm just going to I'm going to give you permission to unmute here and you should be able to press buttons on your end yeah. there. There you go. Yeah. Great. Hi everyone. Hi, how Hi. was that? Are you Hi. did you have a good nap or, or were you able to stay present? <laughs> <laughs> well, I had my husband beside me. He's a scientific kind of guy and oh, he's wonderful. writing notes and Great. he's understanding it. I'm having a hard time kind of yeah, following it. I'm not scientific at all. But I talked to Alex uh, back in 2018 and uh, when I had a third recurrence of lung cancer and uh, he told me about targeted treatments at that time. And mm -hmm. so I kind of held out with my oncologist, said no to chemo. I said, let's do some genetic testing. And long and short of it, I qualified for immunotherapy. Uh, I took Pembrolizumab for two years, had Great. just phenomenal results. So Wonderful. Thank you, Alex. Yes. Um, yeah, I, I, I stopped taking the immunotherapy back in um, March of 2020, yeah. after two years. Yeah. So I've been off now for a year and a half. Wow. And uh, had a PET scan in September, and it's all clear. So oh, things are looking excellent. good for me. But I'm sure happy to hear all this information you've provided, because it leads me to, to hope that there may be even yeah. other options down the road because immunotherapy may not have cured my cancer. I may, it may still recur, but there are so many different things available now. So yes. I feel very hopeful yes. and uh, really appreciate the information. Thank you so much. Um, You're welcome. You just LK. made our day. Yes. LK, yeah. I would like to say um, uh, typically if you are still cancer-free two years after stopping pembrolizumab. I think that's it for you. You don't need to worry anymore. Um, in oh, most cases oh, where wow. you have that kind of, uh, you, you, we see extremely, you know, you either respond very long-term and, and we only have data for the last six, seven years. So maybe it comes back after seven years or eight years. Yeah. But if you've responded this long, I mean, when were you first diagnosed? Well, 2011, it's been 10 years. There but, you go. Uh, it was chemo and radiation for yeah. years. Yeah. And then uh, in 2018, immunotherapy was available in BC. And um, you recommended yeah. the testing. And I, I just sort of was very typical Beautiful. for what, what immunotherapy targets. So I really lucked out and, uh, and, and that's, very, very grateful. That's amazing because before all of these targeted therapies and uh, you know standard chemo would provide a survival rate of of you know stage four lung small cell lung cancer of about a year and a half, if that. Oh, I I have been through hell if you don't mind the word because right. I kept having recurrences and they did right. the radiation. I right. had radiation three times, wow. sixty doses, and wow. I, I've just been through the mill and then wow. immunotherapy has just done the trick. It cha it's changed my life. For 10 so, years. That's just so phenomenal. So yeah, happy for you. Yeah. And two years cancer-free. We just yeah. don't see that. We just Is don't that right? see that before well, immune therapy. Well, that's what my oncologist keeps saying. She just doesn't yeah. see that. I'm one of that's her. brilliant. I'm so uh, happy for you. Success that's, cases. So. Yeah. Yeah. And that so is I wish exciting. everyone else the same kind of success. I think targeted yeah. treatment is just phenomenal. It it's is. just yeah. turned cancer into kind of a chronic condition. Exactly. Perhaps, rather that's than, our goal. That's our goal. Than uh, a death sentence. So yes. I want to thank you for the information. I'm going to kind of okay. leave at this point and yes. allow you your, your live consults. But thank you so much. You're hey. welcome. Thanks for, for being all here. That up to date information. Oh, my privilege. Thank you. Bye. Thanks, Here. Alex. Bye bye. Bye. Good luck, everyone. I wish you well. Thank you, Elke. Top left corner. Okay. Top well, that's left. an awesome story. Yeah. Yay. And we didn't plant her in the audience, just so you know. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks so much, Elke, for coming. Uh, okay. Now, um, Kay, you were here next. Did you have any questions? And we're going in order of arrival here, I think, to be fair. And no mm -hmm. pressure. Did Was there anything you wanted to ask? You can shake head yes, no, yes. Okay. I'm going to invite you to unmute yourself here. Am I on now? You are. Yes. Hi, Kay. Hi. Hi. Um, I have been taking um, targeted therapy, osimertinib. Oh, um, wonderful. Okay. Yes. Um, however, I've had resurgence. Okay. I didn't find out I had lung cancer until um, 
last year, um, March 2020, had yeah. no symptoms whatsoever. Yeah. They actually, by mistake, found it in the brain, mm. uh, which is metastasized, obviously. Anyway, I uh, have got, uh, what's it called? E EGFR. EGFR. EGFR medications, yeah. Uh, 18 and, and 21, which is a bit unusual, I believe. Okay. Um, and the osimertinib they put me on uh, worked. However, there has been a resurgence now. Yeah. So um, I have had during this time radiation. Yeah. Um, and now they've sent another biopsy away. Um, I had a, this time, a bronchoscopy. Yuck. Um, and it's going to Boston, I believe. I okay. mean, we, we are in New Zealand, so okay. a long way away. Um, so had the first test through the lung mm -hmm. biopsy originally, and that was when it came up with the EGFR. Now, the one thing that I am going to ask that I've never heard of in this country um, is this blood test that you have. What countries have that, and are we able to send my blood there? We have it. Um, we've um, there's a lot of liquid biopsies out there. The difference between most liquid biopsies is they're used for discovering new mutations, like the T790M. They're not used for monitoring old mutations. So because of that, we've developed our own liquid biopsy, and I'm in the liquid biopsy lab here right now. And we have a process that we've used for about three years now that um, isolates the exosomes and then looks at the amount of DNA in them and gives, gives you a relative amount. So you, we could send you a few tubes and you could use our liquid biopsy. Mm -hmm. um, the tubes preserve the blood for weeks uh, at room temperature, which is a new advance. And this is the reason we can do these tests anywhere in the world. And um, yeah, we can, we can monitor that. Now, in regards to your recurrence, whereabouts is your recurrence? Is it in the lung? Um, yes. Okay. Um, I, the, so I'm under two oncologists. One yeah. is the drugs guy, yeah. and he's great. And the other one is the radiation right. oncologist. Okay, yes. And he said when he targeted the uh, primary, yeah. And by the way, I was a non smoker, total non smoker. Yeah, EGFR, so that's common. Um, yeah. the, um, he thinks he may have missed a couple of cells at the very top of the primary, mm. which is a bugger. But anyway, um, so he's going to target that at a later date. But my brain, um, one of them is gone. It's only by one mil, but, um, but they, they start on that on Tuesday and I've got five. Uh, it's called... Um, SB, um, where they blast, they, they, they target and just on the one spot, you know, okay. with a okay, beam. Good. Yeah. Yeah. So it's not the whole brain. Okay, good. Um, good. Thank God. Yes. Um, now, the other thing is that the doctor has said, the oncologist chemical guy, yeah. has said when he gets the news back from Boston, which mm -hmm. is the medical foundation, I think. Foundation, um, medicine. foundation one. Yeah, foundation Pardon? one. Yeah. It's tumor DNA sequencing. Excellent test. Was okay. it was it blood or and was it bio? I get that done in Australia or here, so it's going to Boston. Yeah, yeah. Um, and they uh, they went in on Friday, this Friday, mm -hmm. and got it from the Hyla. Okay. The Hyla node. Okay. So um, fingers crossed. Um, but he did mention about doubling the um, doubling the um, I I've not heard of that before. That was just the last time I was in with him. Okay. Um, okay. But he said there's another thing that's um, available now that's just come out. Yes. Um, and I can't remember the name, but he said it's absolutely brilliant for your cancer as well. Yes. But at yes. 65,000 a week, well, uh, no, <laughs> that ain't going to happen. Um, but I guess 
uh, AstraZeneca will cap it at some mm. stage, yes. hopefully sooner rather than later. Right, oh, right. So uh, a few questions. Do you have the T790M mutation? Do you know? I, I'm looking through my um, records here and I can't find that. Okay. Um, I, we've, I've had a lot of pets. Okay. I've, every three months I've had uh, okay. a pet CT. Um, okay. It's quite readily available in Auckland. Yeah, great. And Wonderful. I have an MRI every okay. three months as well uh, by okay. a particular, um, what's that there? What's that word? S-A-B-R. Oh, no, that's the radiation. Okay. So um, I've had a lot of stuff going on for okay. a while. Okay, so here's the deal. Um, you've, uh, you've had this metastasis to the brain. That's probably going to be well targeted. And, and, and the, um, spine. Okay. So radiation is really effective at targeting metastasis to the brain from lung cancers, especially in EGFR positive, um, lung cancers. Um, now what the doctors are thinking is that they will see a new mutation, uh, a runaway mutation in your new metastatic deposit. And that's why they've sent that sample to Foundation One. Unfortunately, what we usually see in metastatic returns in your subtype, um, and we did list a bunch of different things, um, the different recurrence mutations. When we went over EGFR, did you, do you recall, we looked over the types of things that cause a resistance? Yeah. So they'll be looking at those, and hopefully <laughs> one of those will pop up. But um, the chances are you won't see anything there. Chances are you will um, likely have an overexpression change. And therefore, you want to use a completely different test. You want to use the expression test um, that is available that will look at overexpression of the genes in the new tumor and see whether it's an NTRK or an ALK or one of these other genes that is causing the change or whether it's overexpression of a different gene other than EGFR that can be then, then for targeted in the new tumor. It's unlikely that you'll find a new mutation, but if you do, then that would be great. But um, yeah, so I think that's the important thing is you need to be looking at overexpression of the 20,000 different genes in the new tumor. Would you, would you double the Tigresso? Would you double it? Would you double the Tigresso or not? I, I would give it a shot, yeah. Yeah, okay. yeah. I, I, um, I, would, I would look at seeing if you can combine it with something else too. Okay, so you can combine? Yeah, yeah, you can. I mean, I'm sure Richard knows this, but- um, yeah, There's tons of different studies on that, yeah. So, but yeah, see if, see if uh, doubling it works, um, but I suspect it's gonna be a different mutation that's causing the problem. And, okay. and, and, or sorry, not a different mutation, but a different alteration. And I, I, I assume it's gonna be expression. Um, it might be a gene mutation that we mentioned, but um, in order to determine, you've got to get the expression testing. Um, expression. Michelle, yeah, Is that Michelle, the blood test or? No, it's not blood, it's from a tumor. Oh. We need to oh, use tumor okay. tissue, yeah. It's RNA, we look at the RNA. Now, what about the blood testing? Would that help you? Would um, the blood testing help as well? Yes. So what your doctors should have done, um, and I don't like to say should have done because they're doing an excellent result. They're doing an excellent thing right now. When you have a emergence of a lung tumor, you want to use the foundation one liquid, which is a blood-based test. And then you want to save any tumor sample for RNA expression testing. Mm -hmm. Uh, having said that, uh, um, working uh, on the administrative side of coordinating these tests, uh, oftentimes pathology labs don't send all the tissue they have, so they're very yeah. likely it is still some tissue at the pathology lab at the hospital where you had your surgery for, for the removal. Um, and additionally, Foundation Medicine and other genetic testing companies usually don't use the whole sample they're sent, and they do return what they don't use back to the pathology lab. So if you'd like our assistance with that, we can really just make a call on your behalf to the pathologist, find out what they've got, and then assist with coordinating that RNA oh. test. Oh, great, because you're closer to where they are than I am. <laughs> oh, yeah, time-wise, definitely, yeah. Would that be done to him? 
Um, and would they send it on to you or? Uh, as we would need to get you to just sign a form to give us permission to oh, access right. that and then that's right yes so we can follow up via email k and um and discuss what your needs are and and how we can help should we discuss this with our oncologist as well of course uh, yeah. oh of course um, yeah yeah absolutely um, it's all right it's just kai's husband here asking questions <laughs> yeah, excellent no problem it's good to have support. Hi. 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 <laughs> it's good for you both to hear this and to be on the same page about your next steps and what makes the most sense. So we're happy to yeah. speak to you and further. As that lady was saying before, she's been through so much, and I understand that. Um, yeah. And I sometimes you don't take it all in when you're the patient. No. You take a lot in, and then all of a sudden you think. Is what, what happened? Yeah. So oh I yeah. The other one. <laughs> you get stuck on one thing and and miss. Uh, yeah, it's a lot. It's a it, there's a lot of important stuff happening and it's very stressful. So it's hard to pay attention. That's why we 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 have all this written down for you to take away as well. Yes, because when I got told only a week ago about the resurgent, I think my brain went into. <laughs> multitask I oh, was like yeah. well, I <laughs> it's traumatic news yes. it, it was because I didn't expect it you know like I'm quite you know active and um jeepers gave me a real shock so yeah. um yeah. I'm now starting again yeah. um the, he has mentioned the um um my oncologist uh, about Katruda, which is that PIM. Pembrolizumab, yeah. Yes. Yeah, um, yeah. Um, Australia seems to be very uh, at the forefront with um, immunotherapy, is that correct? Yeah. yeah. So um, one of the problems is, is there is a counteractive pathway in EGFR positive lung cancers that doesn't use the PD-1 system. So um, it, chances are pembrolizumab is not going to work for you in EGFR positive uh, lung cancers. However, if we do a um, expression testing and we see you have high levels of slave four, then we can determine whether ipilimumab will benefit you, which is the, the other immune therapy. And we can also look at whether you have a high expression of, of your um, uh, PD-1 um, genes and so on. So, you know, we can look at a variety of different things. We can look at expression of the receptors and genes on your tumors um, and determine a, a variety of different options. But I, I'm going to assume that um, there's going to be some other targeted options for you. How do we pay? That's for great. How would we pay now, um, we would pay you. Is that right? Uh, it, we can we can follow up about all that detail. It depends on which test you're you're having and what kinds of things that we're helping to coordinate for you. Whether you pay the testing facility directly or I've us. Paid, I've paid Boston already. Um, <clears throat> so um, if I sign some forms, they can send the information to you. Yes, absolutely. Right. Yeah. Yeah, we can get all oh, your look, medical thank records you so much, and everything. Guys. Oh, you're welcome. Okay. I'm really really glad you were here. Thank you. Thank you so much. It's actually lovely to see your face and be able to talk to you. It is. I know. I really love this technology for that very purpose. Very <laughs> nice. Uh, now, who else? Uh, let's see here. Where did he go? Was, uh, Jim, are you there? Where'd you go? Thank you. Sorry. Hang on a second. We have Amna. Amna's had her hand up. I know, but it was just... Bye. It, bye. It, bye. Thanks for being bye. here. Bye. It Thank was so technically uh, Jim's turn, but he just disappeared. So we'll go to Amna and then we go to Elia, Eliau, oh, pardon me. Hello. I apologize. I know I could do better with that. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Amna, I'm going to, uh, let's see here. We're gonna lower your hand. I'm gonna, there we go. Oh, where'd you go? There you are. Can you hear us, Amna? Yeah, 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 I hear you right. very well. Okay, uh, thank you very much for this uh, very uh, useful session. You're welcome. You're welcome. Yeah. yeah, I am a practitioner myself, and uh, the, secret, the cancer patient is my husband, actually. Okay, okay, great. And uh, he don't want to do anything with his condition. 
<laughs> you just go and take the medication and come back. That's it, okay? Right. How long ago was he diagnosed, Amna? Yeah, so I will come to that, yeah. And I'm taking care of the rest, okay? And uh, actually, my husband was diagnosed in September 2018, okay. which is now he hit his third anniversary this month, last, last month. Great. Okay, and uh, my husband worked with the United Nations and he worked overseas. Okay. So one day he just called me, he was coughing, he's a smoker. Okay. And, and he, he, was, he was traveling in uh, different countries, he was coughing and I thought it is just like a cough, you know, like you don't have to worry about it. Okay, and one day he called me from Africa and he told me he coughed some blood. Oh. Okay, so next day he had his uh, chest x-ray and they find the lump on his uh, upper left lobe. Okay. And then he took a plane and he came to Canada same day. Okay. Uh, we are in Ottawa now. Okay, and, and, and we start the journey from there. He has been diagnosed and he has uh, KRAS mutation. Okay, KRAS? Yeah, KRAS medication. Yeah, okay. and uh, at that time there is no medication for that, target do medication you, or anything. Do you know so what mutation he has? Uh, cross, um, uh, da, da, da. let me get you the numbers here. Just one second. Okay. And uh, the one they got the targeted medication for it recently, it is the same one. So, Just sorry. Okay. Yeah, so uh, he started on a combo uh, chemotherapy plus the immunotherapy from the get go. Okay, was that the Pemetrexed? <laughs> Yeah, Pemetrexed, yeah. radiation and um, no, no not radiation at that time. No, not radiation. It is it is uh, uh, two uh, uh, two uh, chemotherapies. Okay, so it's a platinum <laughs> drug and Pemetrexed. Yeah, exactly, and the Kitroda. Okay. okay. Okay, and uh, at that time they find they find uh, one of his lymph nodes also uh, infected. Okay. So he has been shifted, uh, like he was not operable at that mm -hmm. point. Okay, and the other things on the right lung, they find small spots, okay. very small spots, okay, uh, scattered around the whole lung. Okay. Okay, they did a lavage and the lavage came negative. Okay. But still they were not sure if that is cancer or not cancer. Mm. So he was not, he deemed unoperable and they tried to uh, put him on the medication. Okay. At that time, we did the brain, bone, name it. There is no metastasis or anything. Okay, good. good. So anyway, he, he and, and uh, the, actually he had a very good, um, re really very good response to the medications. Was he high PD-1? Uh, it is intermediate. Intermediate, okay. Intermediate, so like 50% exactly. Oh, okay, okay, yeah. Yeah, so, but he responded very well, okay. And the lump shrunk, shrunk, shrunk. Uh, when he was diagnosed, it was 4.9. And then yeah. it came down to 0.7 millimeter, 0.7 centimeters. Oh, great. Okay, and he was asymptomatic. He's, uh, he, he, and, and, and actually he had the least side effects from the medication. Wonderful. Okay, so he already did very well and everything has went well, okay. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, last year, September last year, he felt dizzy. Mm. Okay, he felt dizzy and uh, headache and all these things. We went to emergency. Went one day. We went to emergency and uh, with, mm. with dizziness and headache, and they find a lump on his brain. Okay. <clears throat> they did a surgery next day. Mm -hmm. They took the lump. The lump is down there on the. Okay. Uh, yeah, yeah, uh, and, and they took it all. It was very successful surgery, and okay. they find very small spot on his temporal lobe. Okay. So they did the radiation. After that, they did it to the surgery site, and at the same time to that uh, spot on his temporal. Okay. Okay. The surgery went very well. He was fine. He was not dizzy. He, uh, everything was fine. Okay. Okay. And then they follow him with, uh, follow up with him with uh, with uh, every three months MRI for his head. Yeah. Okay, and at the same time, every every three months, CT scan for CT scan for his okay. uh, lung, mm -hmm. and at that point, uh, he he hit the two years of uh, chemotherapy, immunotherapy, so they stopped it. Okay, and uh, he had no s whatever symptoms for the lung cancer. He was not coughing. He's doing very well. Okay, okay, but but these brain things really shocked us. Yeah. Okay, and. Uh, 
And then we, uh, they told us it is the same kind of tumor from the lung. I'm not sure if they did the mutation or not from mm -hmm. your session today. But when they told us it is the same tumor, I assume that they did the genetics. But today I'm going to check with his doctor after this session, definitely, mm -hmm. if they did the genetics or not. Yeah. OK. Yeah. And uh, yeah, last time, last MRI, which, you, which was uh, six weeks ago or five weeks ago, they find also a small spot on the magna, mag, uh, foramen magnum. OK. Mm. Small spot there. And, and you know the proximity of the to the, to the spine and everything. So we just got worried. And they did a radiation therapy for it. They radiated. It is very small. It is uh, four millimeters. But okay. the, the doctor decided to do the cyber knife and they radiated. it. Okay. And we are waiting for another MRI to see if there is anything new in the brain uh, on the 20th of this month. OK. Uh, the thing is that the small temporal one, it got treated totally with the, with the, MRI, with the, with the cyber knife. When the MRI, it is not showing or anything. Okay. 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 So for now, he's not in any medication. Yeah. For the time being, he's not in any medication. Clinically, he's doing fine. Yeah. His blood work is excellent. And actually, his blood work is always excellent. He never had any abnormalities on his blood all this time okay. throughout okay. the last three years. Okay. Now he's in no medication. We're just waiting for this MRI. I, my question is just are we missing anything here? Is there anything we can do? Yes, there's a lot. Help. Yes, there is a yeah. lot. Um, last, sorry. Uh, last time I discussed with the doctor, mm -hmm. on our last, yeah, I, I discussed with him this new medication for the KRIS, uh, uh, yeah. target medication for it. And he told me he doesn't need it now, but it is something we can put in our back pocket. pocket. Mm -hmm. If we need it, we can, okay. we, we can use it. But at the same time, he told me that one is the maximum, I'm not sure of this, uh, research uh, result. He told me the maximum uh, benefit of it is maybe like one year or so, right. so far. Right, yeah. so far, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so, so just, um, yeah. Mm. So does he have the C mutation then? It only works for the C mutation. Same, yeah, because he told me yeah, it worked for that mutation. I don't have my book right now. In okay. front of me. But he told okay. me yeah, this medication works for your husband, but yeah. as long as he's doing fine now, yeah. We are not going to use it. We are going to just wait if he needs it in the future. Okay. So uh, there are a few things. First off, in dealing with a brain metastasis, um, I know an excellent doctor in your area. Uh, he's actually in Toronto, just a, a wonderful human being and just an amazing doctor. And he does something called the Nico Myriad Brain Path Surgery. Um, I don't know if you are aware of that, but it was actually developed in Ottawa. Um, and um, now it's in the States. Um, there's not a lot of Canadian doctors trained in this type of surgery, but what it is... What, what is his name? Uh, um, I'll, I'll, well, I'll give you that afterwards. Um, yeah. uh, we can discuss this. I can, I can call him and ask if, if he can help you out too. Um, he's, a, he's a friend of mine and um, just a wonderful individual. So what, what, a, what he does is he does a kind of... Uh, you can Google this. It's called, moment, please. Yeah, it's called uh, the... Uh, it's called the... Uh, it's called the Nico Myriad Brain Path. Just hold on, please. One second. It's a, it's a type of surgery. Actually, my husband, my husband, Sergey husband, has been done by Dr. Sinclair. Okay. I'm okay. not sure. <laughs> so he's had the brain path? He had, the, sorry? Did he have the Nico Myriad Brain Path surgery? I don't know what kind of surgery it is. Okay, well, this is, this is what I'm talking about. Is I'm talking about the Nico Myriad Brain Path Surgery. What, what is that surgery? Can you give, give me? Okay, it's, it's a special type of surgery that uses uh -huh. a very small incision, and it can go anywhere in the brain, even into the brain stem in some circumstances. But it's really good for deep-seated tumors that can't be taken out through normal surgery procedures. And basically okay. what, what it is, is it's a process where they create a path through the convoluted folds of the brain called the sulcans. And yeah. um, then they create this corridor and they insert this very thin little tube in there and it sucks the tumor out right there. And the tumor has a cutting head that it's internalized. So it does, it, so they can work next to blood vessels and major um, nerves and so on. And they can go places in the brain that no other surgeons can go. And it's a specialized okay. tool. So I have a, I have a friend in, in Toronto who is a leading doctor in the surgery and I can hook you up with him. And if there's any, any tumors that can't be 
um, targeted properly, um, I'll connect you with him and he will be able to remove them. Now, the other thing too, is um, you don't want to rely only um, on uh, the, 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 the tumor DNA sequencing. You also would greatly benefit from having the latest brain tumor sample, having RNA expression testing for that. I would highly recommend that because it could open the door for all kinds of different targets. You don't know what sort of mutations. Maybe he has an ALK mutation and you, know, you can get some years out of the ALK inhibitors. There's a, a host of different mutations or overexpression that are not gonna be found in a standard tumor DNA sequencing panel. So I think it's really important to have tumor DNA sequencing as well as expression testing. Okay, okay. my question is, can the, can the mutation um, change throughout the, the disease time? Yes, oh. yes, definitely. It, that's, that's why you become resistant. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, it doesn't mean that it doesn't mean that the old mutation. So when you have a cancer, what happens is there's a variety of different mutations. And what happens is um, I think of it as I like to use the bus, the driver and the bus um, analogy. So think of cancer as a bus that's driving down the highway and you have a driver that is driving the bus and then you have a bunch of passengers in the bus. So what happens is you hit it with a drug that targets the mutation, the driver, and the bus pulls over, the driver gets up and sits down in the passenger seat. And then all of a sudden, one of the passengers gets up and goes into the driver's seat and starts driving the bus again. So what you need to find out now is what is the new driver? Which passenger, which previous passenger is now driving the bus? And then you need to target that because it's the new driver. Okay, okay. Okay, and you would do that through both genetic testing and expression testing, but more likely in your situation, it would be through expression testing. Okay. Okay. Okay, yeah. C can you send for me all these recommendations in my email, please? Yes, I'm not, we'll do that. Okay, thank you very much. I appreciate mm -hmm. it. You're welcome, thank, thank you. you. Thank you, thank you, very useful, thanks. Okay. And so who's, who's next? Uh, Let's see here, Elia, ooh, uh, let's see here. I'm trying to make it happen for you here. Um, if you can unmute yourself. Done. Yay, Hi. there you go. Thank you okay. for your patience. You've, Thank you've, you. <laughs> you've waited and it's your turn. It's so my pleasure, it's my pleasure be to be, be in the middle between you guys. Michelle yeah. and Alex. Wonderful. You gave, you. You, really, you gave me very, very interesting uh, right. information. Are you you're uh, from Israel? Are you from Israel? I'm, I'm not born in Israel. I'm living in Montreal. Ah, oh, I was born in Montreal, but um, I visited Israel. Oh, okay. Nice. Yes. Nice. Then, <laughs> anyway, I'm 20 years old. Uh, I'm 20 years in Canada already. Mm. Nice. Uh, Welcome. Okay, then. Um, you, you brought me to ask uh, only one or two questions, okay. according to what I told you before, that now I'm in anyway in chemo treatment yeah. uh, in the Jewish hospital. Uh, I have a good uh, oncologic, yes. I think so. Yes. And uh, the, I did that Friday, I did my second chemotherapy. Okay. The adjuvant uh, chemotherapy, the second go for the four treatment. Okay. The first treatment, uh, my side effect was uh, normal, not so bad. But in the blood test before the, the, third, the, the second treatment, find out that my uh, uh, small white cell, the, uh, sorry, the white cell yeah. was dropped down to zero two. Yeah. Very Neutro bad. It's called neutropenia. Yeah, exactly. In Ethiopia, uh, he gave me antibiotic just to avoid that I got uh, an inflammation, and the test on the last Thursday was good, back to normal. And he gave me uh, another chemo on Friday, but he changed the chemo. Okay. He told that the first one, uh, he gave me the aggressive, very aggressive. And the second one, it was another chemo. Uh, took only three hours. The first one, it was seven hours. Do you have the names of the chemo drugs? Uh, yes, yes. So one of them is uh, etoposide. Etoposide, yeah. yeah. Etoposide. Yeah. And the other one, 
If you have a minute, I can find it in my file. Uh, Carboplatin. Carboplatin, platinum drug, right. Okay, yeah. great. Carboplatin is the new one. Yes, okay. The first one he gave me, it was really a big killer. It okay. was too much for me. Which anyway. One the uh, first one? Sorry, which one is? The first, the first one that he gave me, he had to give two, two times water. He gave me about, uh, in the beginning, two bags of the water. I can find the first one if you have a minute. Okay. Do, uh, do you know what type of cancer you have? Yes. I have uh, uh, early, early discover cancer, cancer uh, because I smoked 50 years. Sorry, sorry, what is it? I was smoker 50 years. Okay. So do you have, my, is it a uh, My doctor, my, I don't have any symptom. My doctor, she sent me to CT scan because she say I'm smoking too much and yeah. no symptom. And she said, then the government gave me the CT scan. Yeah. And they found the mass. Okay. Uh, five centi mass and they start. Okay. I went to a lab uh, doctor, you know, David Small in the Jewish uh, hospital. Yeah. yeah. And he sent me to the surgery, make me a MRI that I did it only two, two weeks ago because, because the corona disease is delayed. The yes. waiting is too long. Yes. yes. And uh, I did the surgery two months ago. Uh, the surgeon is the name Dr. Spicer okay. in McGill University. Okay. And after the surgery, uh, I did the second PET scan and they find that everything is clear. Okay, good. And they give me a juvent, but the pathologic of the, after the surgery say that you, they, they mixed large cell and small cell uh, okay. uh, cancer. Okay. In the beginning, they say it's only large cell, but after okay. the pathologic test, they said yeah. it's, it's mixed. Then he decided to give me this uh, type of uh, chemotherapy. Okay. Now my question, after I study exactly what you say, and it's very, mm -hmm. very interesting about the immune, immune therapy. Yeah. That let's say when I finish everything and uh, I have nothing, they say that the PET scan only show nothing, but it could be Microsoft, uh, Microsoft cells that not can see be seen in the PET scan, okay. right? Yeah. It's right. Okay, so my question is, is do you have tumor DNA sequencing? I, I don't have now tumor, it's clean. No, but on your previous tumor? Yes. Did, my, you, have have tumor? Did you have tumor DNA sequencing? The DNA sequencing? No, 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 this, no. Okay. So this is what okay. I'm asking. This is, this is my, what I studied today. Yeah, uh, my question is coming to this. If you have one on one, yes, you need later. you need that. You need yeah. that. Uh, uh, when I finish my uh, chemotherapy in month or two months, I want to be sure that after I study for you, that maybe it's good that I will do this uh, DNA testing. Yes, with your company because I understand that you only you're taking blood test, and you can we, find the the gene. We would use, yeah, we would use your tumor tissue. We wouldn't use a blood test unless you had a certain type. So first, the first thing we'd want to do is we would look at your previous tumor tissue. Now they save your tumor tissue. So that's easy to access. We can just call up Jewish hospital. We can access your tumor tissue and then we can either sequence it in our lab or we can send it to Boston or one of the other labs. But I would recommend since you have a mixed phenotype, you have mixed small cell and non-small cell, that's a very difficult cancer to treat. So I would recommend getting both types of diagnostics. I would recommend tumor DNA sequencing and the RNA expression testing. I think it's very important because you could have a lot of different things going on there. You have a complex case. I understand. But uh, uh, I think the, the McGill University, the, the General Hospital in yeah. Montreal, yeah. they did, uh, did they do the surgery and they did the biopsy. Yeah, Not the so biopsy, that wouldn't be a problem. The pathologic, pathologic. It, it and who I, who I, where I can find the, the, the details? We could get all of that for you. It's not a problem. Mm -hmm. 
yeah, it, it's yeah. Easy, to, easy to access. I understand. Then yeah. uh, what is my next step to do? Get tumor DNA sequencing and RNA sequencing. <laughs> I, I think what he's asking is how does he go about doing that? How do you go I'll about that? I'll follow up with you and I'll give you some suggestions. Okay, you and, have my email. Uh, you have my email. I do. You can send me all the information and call me and ask the question and tell me, okay. You bet. Yes, we can. I can answer as many questions as you have until it all makes sense and you feel clear on what you want to do moving forward. The, the, but I asked it before and I want to be more clear. When I finish my chemotherapy, and uh, how how do they check if it's coming back the cancer? Um, so you want to get regular scans. You can get MRIs. You can get PET CTs. You can get CTs. But MRI when, for the lungs. Uh, yeah, yeah, for the lungs and so on. Yeah. Even, even they remove the the loop because they remove yes. the loop in one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You can still get that. Yes. Um, so there's a variety of imaging and you want to combine that with liquid biopsies. So the liquid biopsy will test whether there's any tumor DNA in your blood. And if the tumor DNA in your blood starts rising, then we know time to get a PET CT, oh, and time oh. to look into it. And you're doing it. Yes, we would do that too. Um, we would need to have genetic information first though. So we need yeah. to know what your genes are or your mutations are in order to track Because one. all the PET scan and all the, I did the all, also I did the, before the surgery, I yeah. did the limp, limp, uh, limp, uh, it's mean uh, limp testing. Yeah. Bio biopsy and they find yeah. that the, all the limbs was clean. Okay, good. Good. That's great news. Great. I'm glad yeah. to hear that. All the limbs. Wonderful. Are okay, then. Good. Okay. Good, okay. good news. Idea yes. about the human human therapy. Yeah. And uh, I, I will keep touch with you and we talk by, by, um, by email. Sure. And I will help you. I will help you to, you can help me. Yeah. Great. Thank you. We'd be happy Thank to help you. you. Yes. Thank you very nice much. Meeting you. You're welcome. Bye, Michelle. Bye, Ali. Thank you. Bye. Thanks for being Thank here. You. Bye. Okay, folks. So let us see here. Is there anybody else you folks have hung in there? We do. Yeah. Uh, we'd be happy to answer one or two more questions before we wrap up. Doo -doo -doo -doo. I'm seeing if anyone's typing. Oh, that looks like it, Alex. Right. So, okay. Well, I think that's it. That's a good two and a half hours of yeah. lots of information. Um, I'll, we'll follow up with everybody who asked for a little bit more information. Um, you will be receiving uh, an email shortly with the replays. You can watch, uh, slow it down, rewind all the stuff and, and a more detailed PDF if you didn't download it from the chat. Um, oh, absolutely, Patricia, you bet. Let me help you out here. Uh, I'm just going to ask you to unmute, so you should be able to unmute yourself. There Hi. You go. Hi, Patricia. Thank you so much. You guys are amazing, Michelle Thank and Alex. I've got you. more information from you than I've had in a year, so it's amazing. Great. Anyway, I, I obviously I have lung cancer, uh, like everyone on here. Um, but um, back in um, March. They did a PET scan and showed that it had metastasized into my lung or my lymph nodes okay. after I had had a lobectomy already. And the oncologist or the thoracic surgeon was very surprised by that because he had done a, a media, you know, the word media stenoscopy mm. into my uh, lymph nodes. And he said they were clear. And then he did the lobectomy. And then all of a sudden, it was in my lymph nodes and my oncologist unfortunately doesn't want to hear anything about genetic testing or targeted therapies or immune therapies oh. Oh. whereabouts are you patricia pardon me where are you i'm in uh, ontario ontario okay and um i brought it up to him a few times so I thought, well, I have no choice, but I have to go the chemo route. I, he wasn't leaving me any options. So I've never been genetic tested. Oh. And my first um, chemo was about a month ago. And I was in the chair six and a half hours, like the gentleman before said, the first one, usually they bombard you mm -hmm. yeah. with uh, cisplatin and yeah. vinyl Okay. And it just 
destroyed me for nine yeah. days. Like okay, literally, yeah. I only weigh ninety-seven pounds now, oh. and um, it. I was in bed for 19 days. I couldn't walk. My liver now is, is they're doing CT scans. They think my liver has been affected. I can't hear out of one ear and I've got oh, ring no. the ear. From the platinum. yeah. Yeah. Um, my intestines were destroyed. I couldn't eat for three weeks. It was wow. awful. And I found out later that I was supposed to have two in-home IV hydrotherapies yeah. and they forgot to order them. So I basically was OD'd on um chemo so i'm not impressed <laughs> no, no, yeah. that. anyway i obviously don't have cancer in my lungs it's the lungs the lobe's gone but now i'm dealing with this um it's a hyper a lymph node involving the right um the tracheal bronchial station for r is positive for sarcoma okay for um sarcoma okay so so briefly what type of of Cancer were you treated for then? Was it a sarcoma? Uh, uh, Non-small cell lung cancer, squamous. Squamous, squamous okay, yeah. And so so a- in squamous, there are genetic features and genetic markers, um, but you know they're not as common as in non-small uh, and in the adenocarcinoma. Right. So a lot of the doctors don't like to do the genetic testing because they think they're not going to find anything. We often find things, just not at the same percentage. So I think you know the Met Exon 14 skipping case that we had in the squamous cell patient was a perfect example. Now you're saying that the lymph node metastasis is a sarcoma. That's what they said. Yeah. Uh, th- yeah, that's exactly okay. It's positive for s- carcinoma. Yeah, carcinoma, not sarcoma. No, carcinoma. carcinoma yeah. Okay, okay, very different. Sorry, that makes okay. a difference. I'm glad to hear that. <laughs> okay. So you found a whole new case here. <laughs> yes, well, uh, so, you know, sarcoma transformation. You know, that, that would indicate almost two different diseases. Yeah, um, no, I, he was totally shocked that it sh- didn't show up when he did all the biopsies during the lobectomy okay. and. Six weeks later, all of a sudden it was there. He went, what the heck happened here? And so did you have a PET CT scan prior to your diagnosis or surgery? Uh, yes. And it showed, the PET scan did show. Um, Lymph nodes were active? Hyper, um, hypermetabolic mediastinal lymph nodes. Okay. okay yeah. So that, yeah, that was active then. Oh, okay. But then it, he did a biopsy and he said I was clean or the. Okay. you know we see that all the time um it's you know it's the tools that they have available right definitely i would get um for your type of cancer i would definitely look into if you can afford it get tumor dna sequencing and rna sequencing if you can only afford one of them just get the rna sequencing oh okay yeah that would be best in your squamous cell subtype because it looks at overexpression now, you want to have a doctor that is saying, Patricia, we want to do whatever you want to do, and we want to support you in whatever you want to do. Right. Yeah. That's the kind of doctor you want. And if right. that doctor is not saying that to you, and their doctor is being intimidating or threatening yeah, or, or anything, you don't need to tolerate that. And you, you know, need to ask for a different doctor. I already um, have, actually. Okay, good. Yeah. I'm glad to hear that. Now, yeah. I'm not saying that this is a bad doctor. I'm going no, into no, with what you're saying here. Um, you know, there's many cases where, you know, someone says to me, oh, I don't like my doctor. They, you know, they have really poor mannerism and, you know, they're rude. And then I'll look at what the doctor's done and you can see the doctor's really gone to town for them. Uh, yeah. but, you know, and then other people say, oh, I love my doctor. They're wonderful. And you look at what they've done and they've done nothing. Yeah. So, um, you know, you can't, you know, we need to look at your medical records to really see if this doctor has not looked at everything and unturned every, every stone. But it's also important that you feel very comfortable with your doctor oh, and absolutely. that you have a good positive relationship and that they're, hey, listen, I may not agree with it, but I'm willing to look at it. Right. That's, that's the kind of doctor you need. Yeah. There's many out there. There's many great doctors out there. There's one in particular that works at the same hospital, and I, she's the opposite of that. She's, she's like you are. She's investigating all the alternative therapies. And okay, good, good. Like a whole Hook different up with body. her. Yeah. Hook up with her, definitely. Yeah. So um, you can do the blood work. Like if I want the RNA sequencing, yes, I can. We can do that do for you. you. That yeah. would be wonderful. Because we'll take care of everything, yeah. 
Yes. That's the very first step, right? Yeah. Yeah. I, would look at, I would look at the genetic testing if you can afford it. Um, we offer a, a discounted genetic sequencing for our patients just because um, you know, we, we like to have as many patients get it as possible. It's just yeah. a game changer. But you know, if that's out of the question for you, definitely just focus on the RNA seek, see what's being overexpressed because really that's the bottom line. Well, they one um, a friend of mine's uh, daughter is an oncologist, and okay. I sent her my bunch of my paperwork, and she said, from what she saw, I have a high immune expression. Okay, well that's important because yeah. cells can respond to immune therapy in certain cases. Yeah, um, she said I would. Yeah be a candidate for one of the ones you mentioned, actually. Um, Katruda? No, it has a big, long name, <laughs> as they all do. Um, yes, 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 she said I would be a candidate for that because of my high immune expression. Okay. Yeah, now Great. she's quite a ways away or I would be going to her now because she's yeah. amazing, yeah. Mm -hmm. That's what she told me, I, immunotherapy. But meanwhile, targeted therapies with that blue first, because I'm stage three. Eight. Well, yeah, so with the, with the targeted therapies, we can also determine whether the immune therapy is going to be effective and which, you know, which type of immune therapy, whether it's CTLA-4 or PD-1. You know, right. it might be a combination of the two drugs. And then what we can do is we can write up a report and uh, present data to whoever your doctor may be. If your right. doctor's not willing to prescribe those, um, you know, there's various ways of dealing with this. Yeah, that's that's great because um, and now I'm in limbo. I've had my last two chemos canceled because my yeah. uh, liver's something's wrong with my liver now from that one chemo. Oh, okay. and uh, yeah. so they have to rule. They just did a CT scan the other day to see what's going on with my liver because obviously if it's huh. damaged. I'm not a, I am not a fan of cisplatinum, um, no, it's it's a kidney it's killer. Uh, I would much prefer, you know, carbo platinum over carbo. cisplatinum and it works just as well in most cases. Uh, yeah. I, anybody I've heard that's gone on cisplatinum said, wow, that's pretty. It's not a, it's, it's, it's definitely a kidney killer. Um, it can affect organs. And a hearing killer. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yes. Well, really? that's, true. that's true with most of the platinum drugs, but yeah. Yeah. Definitely. Yeah. It's unfortunate, but it's true. Yes, and it thank is, you yeah. so much. I'll be looking for it. Should I get in touch with you or will you get in I'll touch? I'll follow up with you, Patricia. It, it, uh, it might be tomorrow as opposed to today, but I'll certainly Oh, no send... worries. You guys are probably tired from listening. <laughs> <laughs> oh, not at all. But uh, you guys are wonderful. But I do, I do have plans for the evening. So I will, I will follow up with you and then um, I can answer your questions about Alex's recommendations. Um, oh, no and, uh, yes, I'm if you need if you need help getting that new lady doctor that you'd like to work with, we can assist with that as well. But it should be as simple as just uh, yes. uh, just asking. Um, I've asked and they aren't responding, and I don't well, know why. But mm, anyway, well, uh, some, that would be wonderful. Yeah. Sometimes having an independent uh, eye on the situation can help change that. Big, yes. big yes. yeah, it does. Uh, usually makes things happen a lot faster and gets yes, a more yeah. positive response. Exactly. Thank you exactly. so much. I'm on cloud You're nine. welcome. Thank you, <laughs> good. Thank you. <laughs> I'm glad after everything you've been through, you deserve to have yeah. some happy news. Thank all the info, you guys. It was so, oh my God, eye-opening, seriously. Thank you. Good, yeah. you're welcome. And, and you, we glad. didn't cover everything. No, <laughs> thank God. On. I'm sure you could go on for three days. <laughs> we probably could, yes. And yeah. by then there would be new information that we'd need to cover. That's right. <laughs> Thank God. It's getting, all this new stuff's coming out. Eh? It's wonderful. Yes. 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 That's the yes. thing. Is that for many years, we were, there was key, you know, surgery, chemo, radiation. Yes. That's that it. it. And yeah. now it's just there's so, yeah. so many new things. Happy Thanksgiving, too. Thank you. you. Thank too. you. You too. too. Have a good weekend. Thank you. Thank you. All right, Alex, I think that's it. Everybody has that's asked yes. questions they wanted to ask. Uh, so um, I, I think that's it. We've, we'll follow that's up it. with everybody. Everybody's going to get an email with, all, with the replay, the PDF, all the information. Um, we'll ask you to give us some feedback. Let us know what we can do better uh, or keep doing. 
And uh, thank you very much for taking the time to thank be here you. and, and staying with us throughout. Uh, and uh, do let us know how we can help you. Okay, thanks so much. Thank Bye. you. Bye. Happy Thanksgiving again. You too, Patricia.